Uh, today we have uh, with us a battery of uh, eminent speakers who will be talking to us about mitochondrial disorders. And I would like to introduce the chairpersons this afternoon. We have with us uh, uh, Professor Sumita Danda, who is the head of clinical genetics at uh, Christian Medical College, Wello. She has done her DM in uh, medical genetics at the uh, Sanjay Gandhi Institute of uh, Medical Sciences at Lucknow. Uh, she subsequently has been with the Christian Medical College for the last couple of decades and has contributed immensely towards the field of clinical genetics. Uh, she has a passion for many aspects of lysosomal disorders, neurogenetics, and other aspects of genetics and collaborates very strongly with the Department of Technology. Thank you, Dr. Sumita, for joining us today. Our uh, second chairperson is uh, Dr. Aran Chapla. Dr. Aran Chapla is uh, at the Department of Endocrinology and is the gentleman who set up the Endocrinology Next Generation Sequencing Lab at uh, the Department of Endocrinology and Christian Medical College of Hello and focuses on multiple aspects of various panels of uh, uh, endocrine related and metabolic genetics. For this uh, evening, we have we are really proudly privileged to have uh, Professor Srikumaran Nair. Uh, Professor Srikumaran Nair is uh, no stranger to most of us in the field of endocrinology, and he has uh, basically been at the Mayo Clinic for the last three decades and contributed immensely to the fields of endocrinology and diabetes across the world. So his uh, specific areas of interest include that of uh, aspects of mitochondrial biogenesis, and has used a number of sophisticated methods, including mass spectroscopy and other methods to study energy expenditure. He's used uh, stable isotope tracers, labeled proteins in vivo, and study synthesis and accumulation of individual proteins. He has held uh, multiple uh, as, uh, uh, roles as leader in developing research at the Mayo Clinic per se. He is currently the endowed EMM Slater Chair and distinguished investigator of the Mayo Foundation. Uh, his focus areas at the present point of time include causes of altered protein turnover and uh, projects which focus on damage and modify proteins related to altered protein turnover. He also focuses on the genetic predisposition for type 2 diabetes. Dr. Nair is keenly interested in the underlying causes of type 2 diabetes in populations with genetic predisposition to the disease as they age. Just a few words about Dr. Nair in terms of his basic training. He is very much a graduate of Random Medical College in, in Kerala and subsequently he did his training in the United Kingdom and subsequently moved on to the United States. So Dr. Nair, thank you very much for being with us and let's give him a hand. Online, we have yet another distinguished uh, person from the endocrine fraternity, none other than Professor Shashank Joshi, who is uh, an endocrinologist of uh, high repute. Uh, Shashank has actually been the uh, uh, president of the Endocrine Society of India and the Research Society for Study in Diabetes in India. He's contributed immensely towards uh, uh, aspects of diabetes in developing countries. Uh, he is the current uh, IDF Chair for South Asia in connection with uh, the International Diabetes Foundation. With these few words of introduction, I shall go on to our academic program. I would like to invite Professor Shasham Joshi to uh, give a few words of wisdom and how this uh, particular symposium might contribute towards enlarging the scope of our knowledge. Over to you, Shashank. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations, first of all, uh, to Professor Nihal Thomas and the entire team of CMC Vellore. Uh, first of all, I, I take this opportunity to wish all of you all a very happy and prosperous 2023. And, uh, you know, we are 8 billion people on planet Earth now. India has just surpassed China in terms of population as the largest populous country on planet Earth. Uh, we have 500 plus million people or half a billion people plus living with diabetes, of which 75 people are living with diabetes in India. Unfortunately, India has the dubious distinction of the highest number of type 1 diabetes on planet Earth. And it has the second largest population of type 2 diabetes on planet Earth. Let me congratulate Christian Medical College and Professor Nihal Thomas for his outstanding contributions to the field of endocrinology and diabetes. We know CMC is one of the foremost institutions on planet Earth, which has done some cutting edge science. 
we are all here for committed for making people living with diabetes their health better and we should be from india uh, you know having a message that we should be the diabetes care capital of the world and therefore we need to eat less eat slowly eat on time but we need to do a lot of more movement or physical activity which is vital apart from sleep and uh, you know being stress free and smiling so i think in that part of contextualization of exercise we are one of the foremost experts on planet earth professor shri kumar nair who is i we call him the mitochondria man from india based out of the mayo clinic and you know it's like uh, it's a delight and pleasure to listen to his pearls of wisdom because mitochondria is the essence of life and i'm going to send nihal an article and dr nair an article yesterday published called social aspects of mitochondria because mitochondria is a part of everyone's life and i think it's a seat of all non communicable diseases and i am congratulating once again nihal always thinks out of the box for having this symposium on mitochondrial medicine uh, much ahead of its time uh, so again congratulations nihal and the entire team from krishna medical college velour for all its seminal contributions to india and planet earth and we are all here as i said uh, to listen to professor k shri kumar nair who has mentored all of us and has been a foremost clinician researcher and always is committed to education and has always been helpful to india his home country uh, not only he's also been an excellent example of translational science even today he sees patients like me and nihal we, we are uh, 24/7 committed to all the three things which is clinical care which comes first then of course uh, research and education so with these words once again i congratulate professor nihal thomas and his entire endocrine team from christian medical college belur for organizing this wonderful symposium i would have loved to be there in person and i am certain that the pearls of wisdom professor nair will let us know and various other speakers in this symposium would enrich us and make us wiser and we will do much more work both in terms of clinical care and research so that we can make people living with diabetes as well as other human beings their lives better they can live longer and they can live healthier thank you so much thank you shashank for those inspiring words i won't see much more of the thunder i'm sure that uh, you will hear a lot more of it from professor nair and i would invite you to take the chair just to uh, let you know that this symposium has uh, got a bit of diversity uh, we're first going to be hearing dr nair talk more about the aspects of mitochondria and its role in the progression of diabetes per se and what it might its importance is and then we'll be switching over to some clinical cases by our faculty from uh, pediatric neurology and uh, subsequently clinical cases in diabetes and mitochondrial disease from our own department thank you very much and over to you professor nair thank you thank you nikhal uh, first of all i must say that uh, i use i admire this institution from a distance for many years and also really had a friendship of many people here especially in nikhal for many years so i really uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit this uh, great institution which i think is probably one of the foremost uh, medical institution in the country even for almost a century so uh, i really appreciate you showing me around uh, whatever i can see within the short period of time uh, what i may do is today focus on mitochondria that's what uh, nikhal wanted me to do uh, well this is <laughs> mayo clinic i just wanted to show uh, because there is some similarities between the institutions uh, this is exclusively the clinical outpatient facility mayo now many of the procedures done in the outpatient basis uh, very few things are done in patient basis so this outpatient facility and you can see uh, some are here uh yeah that's a called methodist hospital it started with the methodist nuns and uh, it has about uh, 500 600 beds uh, they started that and same as this is st mary's hospital uh, which was started by the st franciscan nuns when there was a tornado in rochester uh, they asked mayo's uh, brother's uh, father who was a physician there to help them to treat them that's a very small hospital was started 
then later on, Mayo Pradesh used to operate it. And uh, that hospital became substantially a big part of Mayo Clinic. And Mayo Pradesh once decided to contribute to the entire facility, Mayo Foundation, to Mayo Foundation, which is a non-profit organization. The St. Franciscan nuns are so Methodist uh, hospital nuns, they contribute also the hospital to the Mayo Foundation. They still retain the same name. And uh, so I must uh, quote the Mayo, uh, William Mayo once said that uh, the foundation's aim is to really treat patients or rather patients come first and everything should be patient centered. And since uh, we need to offer the state of art medica medical treatment, education comes next. And we don't have answer to all problems. So that's where the research comes. Mayo has three shields. One shield is patient care and two other shields, research and education. Anything Mayo we do, all three she has to be covered. Uh, that's so even now, I think we have about 150 basic science researches also there, but they also try to tackle clinical problems. Uh, many of them collaborate with the clinicians. And one example is actually the uh, two uh, Nobel laureates uh, in terms of uh, in discovery of cortisol. And soon after cortisol discovered, uh, a, a rheumatologist and a person who discovered cortisol together decided to try it on rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, they found that very debilitated patient within a week or so could walk and, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory effect of cortisol. So that's the way we still work. We investigators col uh, collaborate very closely with the clinicians. After having said that, uh, my research really started uh, in England. With when I was uh, following my, during my fellowship, I would say there is called a specialty registration in endocrinology. My mentor, John Gairo, advised me to stay back and complete a PhD. And uh, his interest was obesity, but I was more interested in diabetes. So I started work there. One thing I was impressed at that time was uh, this picture. Uh, Robert Myler, who was a diabetologist, uh, gave me this picture. And what impressed me most was, uh, if you can look at uh, this side, uh, this uh, pre-insulin era, 1920. This side is uh, four months after insulin is administered. So one thing I was convinced at that time was, uh, at that time, 90% of the research was happening on glucose metabolism. Glucose is the first biomarker of uh, diabetes, and everything was centered on glucose. When I looked at this picture, where there's a huge change in the body composition, especially muscle mass, I was convinced that uh, diabetes is not a disease of glucose alone, but other factors involved. In fact, uh, an ancient uh, Greek uh, physician called Aretas once described diabetes as an affliction where you melt down your flesh into urine. It was also known in the ancient literary, Sanskrit literature and the way they talk about this uh, people with honey urine disease. That means they knew that, uh, you know, they have, they are excreting some uh, sweet things, which was uh, later on found to be sugar. And uh, they also found these people, young people come wasted and they used to let the ants out. If the ants are, accumulate the area where they pass the urine, they think they have honey urine disease. Of course, they also knew the existence of uh, uh, people indulging gluttony and developing type two diabetes. So what I did was uh, initially, I wanted to see if they are wasting what's happening. I mean, they must be spending a lot of energy, which was counterintuitive because uh, based on everything we know, oxygen is consumed, our carbon dioxide is produced. When you consume a fuel, to make ATP, and that's what is needed. But we knew that uh, uh, insulin probably may not store the energy. So what's the need of uh, energy? So I wanted to measure the energy expenditure by indirect calorimetry. What I'm showing the top is, uh, this is actually mostly oxygen consumption. You can see, you can predict based on body composition, how much oxygen they consume resting state, not after the meal. And uh, what we found was significantly higher when the insulin is withdrawn for a short period of time, six or seven hours. And uh, this is when insulin is given back, it's returned to what's the predicted level, showing that, uh, in fact, oxygen consumed, that means fuel oxidizer, 
and also the carbon dioxide produced significantly higher when insulin is withdrawn, which means the fuel is oxidized. I mean, later on, we and others have shown that it's included not only glucose oxidation, more importantly, fatty acid oxidation and also amino acid oxidation, the protein is also oxidized. But the important thing is, uh, I'll come to that, how, what's the underlying you know, underpinning of that. Here, many years earlier, uh, this paper in JCI showed that if you withdraw insulin, uh, there is a substantial release of, or rather excretion of nitrogen in the urine showing that protein is broken down and really, you know, net catabolism. We measured the amino acid level uh, by HPLC. What we found was uh, uh, many amino acid, I'm showing the three branching amino acid, which are the one you can see a substantial increase occurring. This is valine, this isoleucine and uh, leucine. So it's not only glucose goes up. And uh, then, of course, it is already known that fatty acid level also goes up. So all the energy stores are depleted when insulin is withdrawn, or rather the fat is broken down, protein is broken down, and glycogen is broken down, and gluconeogenesis is increased. That's what happened in insulin-deprived state. It's so not only a disease of the glucose metabolism as you perceive, that's, but that's the most important biomarker of uh, diabetes. But it's not only in type 1 diabetes. You know, this is... Uh, <laughs> two uh, people from, I think it's two farmers. And what you are seeing is uh, they also have muscle waste. And uh, of course, they accumulate fat, most of the fat they accumulate in the abdomen. That contributes to their insulin resistance. Insulin resistance also associate with uh, muscle wasting. And I will show the reason why that happens in both cases. Here, what I'm showing is, uh, this is uh, two people. This is a MR scan of the calf muscle. Young person, 24 years old, old person with a severe insulin resistance and mild type two diabetes. And their BMI is very comparable, but look at there. And if you look at the circumference of the calf, it's exactly the same. But that doesn't mean it's all muscle. What you are seeing here is, uh, it's all replaced a lot by the fat and fibrous tissue. Whereas the young people yeah, with no diabetes, this doesn't happen. So both diabetes and aging are a bad combination to maintain the muscle mass. Why it's so important? You know, you will be able to exercise, you are develop a frailty, and uh, you can develop various disabilities later than more importantly, even a reduction in the muscle mass uh, to some extent, reduce your ability to metabolize glucose immediately after a meal. Postprandially, about 70% of the glucose is metabolized by the muscle. If you lose muscle, that ability decline. Of course, muscle also has to be metabolically active. So that's an important aspect to consider. <laughs> well, we measure the met metabolic rate, uh, oxygen consumption, energy expenditure in type 2 diabetes also. When they are not on treatment, uh, their metabolic rate is high compared with the non-diabetic people and also treated diabetes people. So it's not only type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes also. Insulin action is reduced, uh, same thing happened. Well, energy, metabolism, everything take place in mitochondria. That's the reason I focus on mitochondria. Here you can see in a cellular mitochondria, multiple mitochondria cell organelle. In fact, this is actually a bacteria got into eukaryotic cells many millions of years ago, and it stayed there. And surprisingly, you know, once it stayed there, nucleus took control of it. And this bacteria had the ability to burn fuel and produce ATP. So that was given one of the most important role, this invader this bacteria to really do the fuel metabolism. That means oxidating, oxidizing fuel and converting micronutrients to ATP. And uh, this is a mitochondrial DNA. You know, that's only organelle within a cell outside nucleus, which has its own DNA. And it's a circular DNA. As you can see that it's a size is pretty small, 16 kilo button. And, you know, 13 proteins only is encoded. Mitochondria proteins, about uh, around a thousand proteins are there. So all the rest are encoded by the nucleus. But these 13 proteins are important. I'll show you why it's so important. And two ribosomal RNAs, which is in 
involved in protein synthesis within the mitochondria. And uh, then about 22 mitochondria transfer RNAs, which is providing the acylate to the amino acid, providing the substrate for protein synthesis. So most of the proteins are synthesized in <coughs> cytoplasm and transport across the you know, membrane, mitochondria membrane, get into the mitochondria. Then along with the protein synthesized with the mitochondria forms a complex. That's the main functional molecules. Just uh, wanted to show biochemistry, the glucose, amino acid, fatty acid I mentioned. Once it's oxidized, everything go into acetate coin same way and uh, go get into the TSCA cycle. And uh, one CTA cycle, the electrons are formed. The electrons are you know, really transported into the inner mitochondria by NADH and also FAD. And it goes through this electron chain transport into four complexes, mitochondrial complexes. Among this uh, four and three, mainly how also the mitochondrial proteins are involved in that. That means if the complex is not fully formed, that's a defect in mitochondrial function. Mitochondria doesn't function properly. That's uh, what happens in many conditions. I'll come to that. So then, of course, uh, once the electron is transported, the gradient is produced by proton moving into that direction. And, uh, and uh, then these protons are either the complex 5 or ATP synthase really moved across this membrane and the energy is produced, that energy is stored by phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. But this can also be leaked, uh, you know, the, this proton. And uh, that's called proton leak. If the membrane defect or many conditions, uh, this uh, leakage occurs, that's called a state four respiration, otherwise state three or state one respiration. And this is what is reflecting this proton leak is causing the uh, increase the production of reactives in species. In mitochondria, you know, once electron chain transport ATP is what is always is uh, uh, what you call superoxide is formed. And it can be converted by MNSOD, which is uh, SOD2, which can convert this into oxygen and water. But if that doesn't happen, if there is enough uh, antioxidant defense system, which is basically uh, this, SO, this uh, antioxidant defense system, endogenous system is not there, this uh, reactive species can damage the uh, proteins. It can damage the cell membrane. It can damage the lipids. So many damages can occur. A small amount of reactive sense species are needed for signaling, but excess is uh, bad. And that's what happens uh, in many conditions. Well, again, as I mentioned, this mitochondria is a bacteria, got its a muscle EM we had done after a muscle biopsy. And you can see that major site of fuel oxidation and ATP production. ATP is essential for all cellular functions. And uh, cell cannot use uh, carbohydrate or fat or protein or anything, can only use ATP. And uh, major site for reactive oxygen species production, damages of functional molecules and membrane, but in small amounts are needed for signaling. Uh, antioxidant defense is important. Initia it also initiates cell death, reactive oxygen species excess. Well, what I want to say is that uh, uh, if you talk about diabetes and also aging, both uh, have a lot of commonality. In fact, I always consider diabetes as an accelerated aging process, not only in vascular system, but also these three important organs, uh, uh, brain, heart, and uh, muscle. One thing common to heart, brain, and uh, muscle is that all three are post-mitotic tissue. Unlike uh, liver and many other tissues, they don't regenerate much. Once it's formed, uh, very minimal capacity to regenerate. That means if the damage occurs, the damage can accumulate. And uh, uh, I'll be showing some data later, brain and muscle. Uh, we haven't done much work on the heart, but certainly increasing evidence show that uh, diabetes long-term cardiomyopathy. That's the reason diabetes patients, when they heart attack, they are more likely to die than others. And uh, there are many data showing that similar thing that I'm going to show in muscle and brain ha can happen in the heart also. Well, one of the things we did was uh, we did muscle biopsy. We use a luciferase reaction because, you know, luciferase reaction uh, requires uh, uh, ATP. So luciferase reaction produces light. If you have luminometer, 
is you can develop an assay to produce in the measure the ATP level. We do a muscle biopsy, fresh mitochondria or membrane uh, preparation we'll make, uh, sorry, muscle fiber preparation we make, uh, and we can add various uh, uh, substrate and also ADP, and we can measure the ATP production data. When you do that in muscle, you can see this is a three different substrate we provided. And initially, <coughs> measure the oxygen consumption. You can see again, oxygen consumption increases, CO2 production increases, but ATP production decline when the insulin is withdrawn. That means even though fuel is oxidized, it's not, there is no efficient in converting. This is a very short period of insulin withdrawal, not very efficient in converting that into ATP, suggesting there's an uncoupling occurring. And uh, for the studies, uh, we need a lot of biopsy samples and experiments we did on a animal model. A mouse who are induced diabetes by a streptosaurus in multiple small doses. And then we maintain their glucose by a, a diffusion pump, insulin is provided. So they were having pretty normal uh, body composition and all. And then just like in human, we threw the insulin. And what I'm showing here is, uh, this is the oxygen consumption in the whole body. For muscle, it's all the same. The increased oxygen consumption we have shown in human is happening mainly in the liver. And we have shown that uh, that increased oxygen consumption can be inhibited by some infusing somatostatin by reducing glucone level. Then you put the glucone back, this liver oxygen consumption increase. So muscle is not much change in the oxygen consumption, but even though the fuel is oxidized, the ATP production is substantially reduced when you withdraw insulin for 78 hours in this mouse. So insulin absence reduces the capacity to produce ATP, even though fuel is oxidized. So that shows the real uncoupling. And uh, this is showing the respiratory control ratio, state three and state four respiration ratio, which will tell us the coupling efficiency, which are so significantly lower in insulin withdrawn compared with a non-diabetic and insulin treater condition. This is phosphorylation efficiency, which also is reduced. And we measure H2O2 production, H2O2 measurement can tell us uh, how much of reactive species are formed, which substantially went up. So insulin deprivation increases oxidative stress. This, uh, there's no enough buffer system in the muscle. I'll show you in brain has a lot more buffer system. Uh, it can cause a damage to protein. In fact, we measure the proteome and here is showing that uh, this uh, streptosaurus induced uh, insulin withdrawn diabetic, this non-diabetic. When you do that, uh, this shows uh, reduced uh, expression of uh, protein. This uh, increased expression. Here, what you're seeing is all this uh, dotted, fully dotted thing. And also this one, all of them represent the mitochondrial protein involved in electron chain transport, TCA cycle, and other uh, mitochondrial function. All of them are significantly lower when you withdraw insulin from this animal, showing that insulin is so critical to maintain the mitochondrial mass. Mitochondria is critical for ATP production. When you look at uh, the oxidative damage mitochondrial protein, here is insulin treated, insulin deprived, insulin deprivation increased the oxidative damage uh, to many proteins, especially those involved in uh, many cellular proteins, but the protein synthesis chaperone and some of the oxidative uh, I mean, mitochondrial protein, they are all oxid oxidized very quickly. A protein is oxidized. Unless the insulin is there, amino acid there to inhibit them, they immediately degrade. That's what happened. So that's a mechanism by which uh, the oxidative capacity is, uh, or rather ATP production capacity is declining because oxidative damage occurred to the protein and that's damage. Just want to show this is a crowded, uh, but the proteum measurement, what I'm showing here is, uh, these ones, uh, this central one, this, uh, this one is a streptosaurus in diabetic insulin withdrawn. These proteins, uh, the proteins involved in the transport of fatty acid into the cell, they go up. But these proteins which are involved in transport into the mitochondrial membrane, the mitochondria is reduced. This re represents the mitochondrial capacity to produce, uh, you know, oxidase uh, this uh, fatty acid. So insulin withdrawal, fatty acid is released. Fatty acid has a mass effect transported into the 
cell, but transport into the mitochondria. That's where the beta oxidation takes place, and that's reduced. And within mitochondria, the ability to do beta oxidation also reduced. As a result, uh, there is accumulation of this uh, acetyl uh, acyl coin semi, and also uh, many of the uh, beta oxidation byproducts. These things are called oxidative stress and also cause insulin resistance. So you may remember, if you many of you come across, when you diagnose a type 1 diabetes, they come with ketoacidosis or some other reason, poorly controlled, initially they require a large amount of insulin. The reason is they are insulin resistant initially because uh, this accumulation of fatty acid byproducts into the cell causes uh, insulin resistance. So, so type 1 diabetes initially, that's what is causing it. Well, we did a study, this uh, Jalil, who is currently a senior scientist in Rajiv Gandhi Institute of uh, Biotechnology, he spent almost six, seven years in my lab. One thing he showed by stabilizer of methodology and uh, mass spectrometry and or insulin withdrawal increase, accelerate the oxidative damage to DNA synthesize APO lipoprotein protein A1, which is, uh, you know, involved in the HDL function and all, and uh, type 1 diabetes during insulin deprivation. So we also develop a methodology of finding a newly synthesized and old protein, which wasn't there until that time, based on stable isotope methodology. And uh, I don't have time to expand on just to show you one figure. This is uh, APO A1. If you do a 2D gel electrophoresis, usually it should appear in one spot. But when you are, when you did that, we found this uh, appear in different spots. So we each one of them we amino acid sequence, and we found that this is a newly synthesized pro epo one And here is a very old one, oxidatively damaged one. And what we did to us, we did the measurement of this one somewhere in the middle. What we are seeing is uh, this isotopic enrichment, the stable isotope we are infused. And uh, here is the highest. It should be highest here. If it's a newly synthesized one should be here. So then we also found this area has a lot of oxidative damage. So the conclusion from that study is that uh, if you draw insulin for a short period in human, APO A1, is uh, immediately oxidized and move into from new protein to old protein immediately degraded. And uh, you know, if you think about that, that process takes place and also if they are treated with insulin, this APO1 is accumulated. If you remember type 1 diabetes patient, the HDL level is either normal or high, but they are not functional. The reason is this damage occurring to APO1, all APO proteins happening in insulin withdrawal. We further look at the muscle biopsy. When we draw insulin, we found uh, all these proteins uh, are degraded at fast rate. This is a human data, muscle biopsy, and they are involved in energy homeostasis. So consistent with the hypothesis that uh, oxidative damage occurs to all proteins in the insulin deprived state and uh, mainly happening in the mitochondrial protein involved in the energy metabolism. They are all degraded. And also we found uh, many of the translational machinery, ribosomal uh, ribosome, that also degraded. So your ability to synthesize protein also declined when insulin, in the absence of insulin, and because these proteins are degraded. Further, we found that, uh, yeah, as a result, if you, we performed this study many years ago, uh, I did this in collaboration with John Warren and Karolinska Institute. We catheterized the femoral artery, femoral vein, and also hepatic vein, use stable isotopes of the amino acid to trace the kinetics occurring. And I'm only showing what happened in the muscle. What happened in the muscle is uh, using a label phenylalanine. We are showing that, uh, in fact, insulin withdrawal increases uh, protein degradation in the muscle. As opposed to at that time, the dogma and textbook information that uh, muscle wasting occurred because protein synthesis reduced based on in vitro data. In fact, protein synthesis doesn't change because there's transcripts are there on short term insulin withdrawal, and uh, translation is mainly stimulated by uh, the uh, amino acids. So, it they really just like a glycogen store and that's of fat, uh, muscle also degraded on short-term insulin withdrawal. The main acute effect of insulin is preventing degradation of uh, all the storage of calories, which is in terms of amino acid, which is protein, 
and fatty acids in terms of fat and there's amino is glucose in terms of glycogen. Well, I just wanted to show this data. Recently, he was one of my fellows uh, who later on became the professor and director of endocrinology in Arizona. He did a pioneering study when he was working as a my fellow in my lab. And unfortunately, Craig Stem recently died of a advanced lymphoma. And this is a study Craig did. Uh, oh, what happened to that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened to that. What I want to show here is NADH4, COX3, and COX4 representing both the mitochondrial encoder gene and nuclear encoder gene. Those mRNA levels by PCR significantly increase by infusing insulin. I'm sorry, this disappeared. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> when I was showing, it's looking at the slide, it was there. He not only that, he also showed that uh, uh, the protein synthesis also increased along with that. So mainly this study show that uh, insulin not only really inhibit uh, degradation of protein, inhibit also stimulate uh, synthesis at transcription level and also translation level. So both of them goes down when insulin deficiency occurs. Um, it, these are mostly mitochondrial protein. That's the reason mitochondrial content decline with the uh, insulin deprived state, also in insulin resistant state, which include uh, aging also partly happens. So the question is uh, type one, what happens here? And uh, we did uh, this study looking at the relative change in uh, ATP production. And what we are seeing is uh, when saline is infused, you can see that uh, uh, ATP production is uh, not changing. When you infuse insulin along with amino acid, amino acid is needed. When you infuse insulin in vivo, because the degradation of protein is inhibited, amino acid will go down. And uh, amino acid is needed for maintaining protein synthesis and function. So what we are seeing is ATP production goes up. The amino insulin is infused and replaced amino acid. This is showing two different substrates, glutamate and myelate, and palmitate, carnitine, and myelate. You can see both of them, insulin and amino acid increases uh, proteins, uh, say ATP production. And uh, surprisingly, oh, something happened to a couple of my slides. Well, what I wanted to show was again, I'm sorry, when you get type 2 diabetes and non diabetic people, much if you infuse somatostatin in them, you can inhibit their insulin secretion and glucose secretion. Then you maintain the glucose at the same level with the same amount of insulin. They have same insulin, same glucose. When you do that, non-diabetic people, insulin increases ATP production. In diabetic people, that doesn't happen. ATP production, type 2 diabetes doesn't happen. Showing that insulin resistance also an effect on ATP production. We don't know because insulin resistant state, the amount of glucose you're infusing is lower. You know, if you do a clump because their insulin sensitivity is low. So that way, that could be a factor. But there is a defect in type 2 diabetes also. Well, the question we asked is uh, type 2 diabetes. We know that uh, exercise can improve insulin sensitivity. Can exercise uh, really correct this defect occurring in type 2 diabetes? So what uh, I wanted to show here is uh, one thing, most of the studies of this thing happening, the rodents, see their <coughs> limbs, how much muscle mass they have, not much. Look at uh, primates, uh, human. <laughs> human about 45% uh, of our body weight in lean people is muscle. So muscle is a key organ involved in human metabolism. Fatty acid oxidation muscle is the key organ. Glucose oxidation postprandial is the key organ. That's not true with the rodents. So always when you translate uh, research and rodent to human, this is something to be considered. And uh, there's increasing evidence that uh, this is what uh, contributed to even larger brain in human. When you start moving on the two legs, and moving fast, 
that seems to have some effect, even though we don't exactly. I'll show some data which may suggest it may be related to mitochondria. And uh, so these two, this organ to legs is so important if you use it, that can not only slow down aging, but also can reverse diabetes and prevent many complications related to diabetes. So that's the reason I'm showing. And they are very sensitive to insulin, rich in mitochondria muscle. But the insulin sensitivity can be improved by an aerobic exercise program and also resistant exercise program. Can exercise rescue mitochondrial defect in insulin resistant states? We did a study in obese, 25 obese people and 14 lean controls. It is all obese women. All are PCOs, polycystic ovarian syndrome, without having any ob obvious uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome manifestation. We wanted to select people who are really insulin resistant. What we did was obese people, after baseline study comparison, we randomized them to either aerobic exercise training program for three months, about 60 minutes of uh, cycle ergometry at the 65% of year to mice, five days per week which is pretty modestly rigorous exercise program and the sedentary control. They just did some stretching. They didn't do the aerobic exercise. <coughs> what I'm showing here is uh, just want to take you back to this one. And uh, if uh, more of a proton leak occurs, that detect by state four respiration and uh, state three respiration with all the complexes, uh, maximum oxygen consumption that represent the uh, you know, state state one, sorry, state three respiration. So if you look at the respiratory control ratio, which is state three respiration divided by state four respiration, that indicates coupling efficiency. And uh, again, ADP or ratio will tell us uh, the phosphorylation efficiency. They, those two will tell the mitochondrial efficiency, basically these two measurements. If you look at the lean people and obese people, lean people have significantly more mitochondrial efficiency compared to obese people. They are not diabetic. They have fasting glucose, which is a borderline of pre-diabetic state. So that way they are severely insulin resistant based on clamp. And so that's one thing we found. Then these obese people who undergo three months of aerobic exercise program, respiratory control ratio significantly improved. They become the same as a lean people and ADP ratio has improved, whereas that did not happen with sedentary control, showing that uh, this defect in the mitochondria in insulin resistant people, even three months of exercise can correct it. And if you look at the it's 2 to raw submission, it's it was basically it's a lower in lean people and exercise corrected the defect in uh, you know obese people. This uh, Obese people, when they exercise, uh, it's sorry, this oxygen H2O2 production significantly reduced. And uh, then their antioxidant defense system improves. Catalase is mainly uh, antioxidants in the cytoplasm, and that significantly improved on aerobic exercise, and sedentary control did not happen. And oxidative damage to DNA, you know, reactive and species can not only damage protein, but also nuclear DNA. And we have shown that in older people that happens. And that also corrected by exercise program. So exercise can do substantial thing in terms of biology, in terms of these are all things also happen with aging, not only in diabetes. So aerobic exercise enhances insulin sensitivity in conjunction with reduce the ROS emission mm -hmm. and endogenous antioxidant defense that reduce oxidative damage to DNA and also protein. We later on did a study. I don't have time to review that fully, but show you some data. This uh, published in cell metabolism. I would say that uh, when uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, commented on by uh, a, uh, one of the one of the uh, commentators in uh, New York Times and also in uh, CNN, and uh, we got so many calls about that, and many people came to see me because they want to get advice on how to exercise, even though I'm not an exercise physiologist. What we have shown is, uh, I'll show you one, this is showing the glucose disposal rate, showing the insulin sensitivity. This is a, a high intensity interval training. 
there about 90% of the VO2 max to exercise uh, four times a week. And the rest of the time, either they do a very modest type, type of exercise. And this is showing the you know, resistance exercise, the high intensity resistance exercise they do. This is combined exercise. That means lower intensity aerobic and resistance exercise. This is uh, young and old people. What I am showing here is uh, glucose disposal rate improved in both equally, young and old people. Three months of uh, high intensity interval training improved. Did the same thing in the resistance training also. So both improve insulin sensitivity. Improve insulin sensitivity in young people. And uh, like us, many others confirm this. Older people need a more intensive exercise program, improve their insulin sensitivity. I always tell my patients, uh, yes, you know, yes, you think you cannot do that, but gradually, gradually increase your intensity of exercise. And they can do three days exercise is not good enough for all the people. They benefit on insulin sensitivity disappear after 72 hours. So I ask them, you are retired, you have time, you exercise every day, at least five days a week. That's critically important. That's what uh, this study, other studies have shown. And uh, if you look at their VO2 max, which is a measure of fitness, but many studies have shown that VO2 max is probably the best predictor of uh, fitness and death from diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, uh, you know, uh, even chronic obstructive airway disease. Many of these conditions, uh, VO2 max is critical. That means if you are aerobically fit, your chance of dying is lower. In fact, uh, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study done for six years in the same population, what they found was uh, the only predictor, in a reliable predictor of uh, mortality, death is uh, slowing down. So it's important to keep yourself active because you're old, you're, you, I will sit around. That's, a, that's not the best thing to do. Any activity will help. And second thing, what we found was state three respiration, which represents mitochondrial function, also significantly improved. Doesn't improve with the resistance training. If, if there is an aerobic component improved. So resistance exercise will help to improve insulin sensitivity, not via mitochondrial pathway. I'll come to that later. More importantly, uh, this is showing the muscle strength doesn't improve with the high intensity or any aerobic training muscle mass can slightly increase. That requires resistance training. Either high intensity or even modest resistance training important to improve the muscle strength. And muscle mass improve highest with, uh, you can see resistance training, but slight improvement occurred in the aerobic training also. And so basic conclusion is that this paper is uh, aerobic and resistance exercise enhances insulin sensitivity. The aerobic exercise is critical for mitochondrial and vascular health. Resistance exercise is critical to maintain muscle mass and strength. But we found that uh, the common thing happens in exercise, especially aerobic exercise, is uh, the, the, the angiogenesis increase. And uh, there is evidence that microcirculation increase uh, in brain in areas involved in the memory by aerobic exercise, and also in the collateral circulation of the heart. Even if you have coronary artery disease, the collateral circulation can provide a perfusion and prevent probably a heart attack. And every tissue that happens, not only in muscle, every tissue you look at that happens, the collateral circulation improve, microcirculation improve, so that uh, oxygen and uh, substrate can be delivered to the cell so that mitochondria can produce ATP. ATP is needed for all functions, including conduction of nerve conduction and many things. So that again suggests the importance of exercise. And so this study, we showed that high intensity interval training or resistance training both increase the transcription of the gene involved in function and the translational capacity. We found ribosomal protein level substantially increase and many Translation RNA is required for amino acid acylation and providing for it, protein synthesis also increases. And we found that uh, protein content increase, not only both uh, mitochondria and uh, muscle hypertrophy occurs. And of course, the resistance training contributes to the muscle hypertrophy and mitochondrial content increase by aerobic exercise. So that's how the oxidative capacity is increased and muscle mass and strength increases. So that's the mechanism of aerobic training. And so we came to this conclusion 
you know, this is based on various studies. Uh, this uh, PGS1 alpha, you know, Bruce Spiegelman is the one who discovered PGS1 alpha. And uh, later on, this PGS1 alpha one is found to be the one going up with the aerobic exercise. Whereas uh, we have shown PGS1 alpha four expression goes up. Uh, uh, there's a paper in cell, we have a paper with the Bruce Bigelman showing the PGS1 alpha four expression in human increases when resistance training, not with aerobic training, whereas PGS1 alpha one expression goes up with aerobic training. Then what happened? That increased the mitochondrial biogenesis. When mitochondrial biogenesis increase, oxidative metabolism increase, that reduces uh, ROS emission, mitochondrial efficiency also increase that contribute to insulin sensitivity. That's why aerobic training is contributing to insulin sensitivity. And uh, of course, glucose and fatty acid oxidation improve, ATP production increase, that's critical for all cellular function. Whereas resistance training improves the PGS1 alpha 4, and uh, which uh, initially a cell paper which uh, uh, George Rua is the first author of that, increase muscle hypertrophy by, you know, that's, by PGS1 alpha 4. Recently, we had this paper in uh, Nature Communication showing that, in fact, uh, PGS1 alpha 4 also increased the uh, glycolytic capacity and increased glycolysis, which means uh, you can immediately metabolize the glucose in the tissue and that way provide ATP. The oxidative pathway, if you go take some time, whereas if you want to lift something, push something, you need ATP immediately. That's provided by the glycolysis. That's how it's improving the insulin sensitivity. They have two separate mechanisms. They're complementary. Well, I want to switch from there to brain. Before that, I want to show that previously we relied on hemoglobin A1C. You know, this hemoglobin A1C 6.4. When you do a continuous glucose monitoring by Dexcom, you are seeing that uh, the glucose is all around them. They are in some deficient state. They're going to various times in you know, hypoglycemia. But hemoglobin A1C is an average glucose. That's the reason increasingly cardiovascular death and uh, many changes occurring in the brain and all cannot be related to hemoglobin A1C alone. The reason is this fluctuation occurring. And whereas... Uh, you can get uh, if you're using a uh, the or you know closed loop insulin pump. You can maintain the glucose at the same level. The A1C is not substantially different. You know we are doing some studies on that, but we wanted to initially see this transient hyper hyperglycemia and insulin deficiency. Does it do anything to the brain? And we did a study where we throw insulin for uh, uh, six hours, and uh, by this is showing. Uh, MR spectroscopy, we look at PCR, and also we looked at the ATP level, and you can see the ATP level is significantly lower in insulin withdrawal compared to the control. In fact, uh, there is also a significant difference ATP level in insulin withdrawal state, insulin deprived state, showing that ATP level is lower in brain, uh, not substantial, there is some, of, but more importantly, insulin withdrawal in these people had significant effect on conduction. This is showing the, some of the, uh, the functional MRI data. I'm not going to take you through the detail. You can see obvious differences. And the conclusion from that study, I don't have time to go through that. Uh, transient insulin deprivation causes alteration by, by cognitive, the executive aspect of cognitive function concurrent with the functional connectivity between memory regions and the sensory cortex. And these findings have important implication as many patients with type 1 diabetes inadvertently have periods of transient insulin deprivation. Suggesting that is something which, uh, you know, many patients will tell you. I'm sure that Nikhal, type 1 diabetes patient, they say that I know when my glucose is high. They get, uh, their brain can sense it. They can't perform as well as uh, when the glucose is normal. So even transient insulin deprivation has an effect. We say that you can drive the car and everything uh, if you are not hypoglycemic, but hypoglycemia also may have an impact. That's where until ILSR transplantation won't come become a day-to-day -day thing, which is going to take a long time. But the currently all my type 1 diabetes patients, 80% uh, switched to this closed loop insulin pump so that they can maintain glucose within a range, which is important. 
Well, I think I sent out this, uh, there's a review, an invited review we did uh, in JCI, which has uh, uh, insulin, insulin resistance said mitochondrial functional changes we are reporting, including the heart based on other people's work, but mostly muscle and brain based on our work. Well, it is well known that diabetes uh, increases with age. Another thing increases with the age is dementia. And there's increasing overlap. There is almost two to four fold increase based on observational studies increase in dementia in people with the type two diabetes. In fact, type one, uh, mostly what happens if the diabetes start early, they have reduction in the, the gray matter region. They have slight hypertrophy on the white matter region. That means uh, the white matter region is compensating by improving the efficiency of the conduction of the message from the brain. That may happen in type 1 diabetes. There are some associated functional defects. That's only if uh, diabetes starts very early age. As I may show, some of the studies published in not our group, uh, some of the European studies show that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, you know, if they are if diabetes start later age, dementia is much less than type 2 diabetes. I'll show you some of the potential reasons. So dementia compared to people without diabetes, people without diabetes have greater rate of decline in cognitive function and greater risk of cognitive decline with age. This is mostly based on type 2 diabetes. Many studies show that type 2 diabetes patients have two to four fold higher risk of dementia. And uh, this is a paper published many years ago in New England Journal of Medicine, showing that uh, this is hazard ratio of uh, developing dementia. And this is a uh, non-diabetic people. Above 100 start going up. That's what it shows. Whereas diabetic patients, they found uh, it doesn't matter what treatment. Uh, in fact, the glucose is low, sometimes it's high. We are not entirely sure about the reason for that. Potentially, it may be when you try to control glucose better, they have recurrent hypoglycemia. Whether that's the reason, we are not entirely sure. But again, there's an association with the glucose level and dementia. Again, if you look back at the ACCORD study, higher A1C levels are associated with lower cognitive function, individual with the diabetes. The effects of glucose lowering on cognitive function remains to be fully determined. Many years ago, again, we did a study to see whether insulin level we change and the glucose level we change, brain uptake of the glucose change by catheterizing the internal jugular vein, which is trained in the whole brain, and also femoral artery. This is again, John Warren and I did this collaboration. And what I'm showing is arterial jugular venous differences. And the difference of the glucose is very minimal. And, but oxygen consumption are going down, the glucose goes below 50. That means, brain not getting enough glucose. How does it pain through that? What brain does is, uh, this is showing the respiratory quotient is the same, almost one, which means the glucose is only if you are used at that time. We infuse amino acids, see brain can use that. Brain cannot use in hypoglycemic take amino acid. You know that if you are starving for many years, uh, brain can glucose ketones, but the ketone level goes very high. But that's only other fuel brain can use is lactate. So here, what we are showing is the extraction of the percent day level uh, extraction of the glucose goes substantially high when the glucose levels are low. The brain needs certain amount of glucose. Irref irrespective of the hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, brain to extract the same level of glucose. That's what we found from this study. Then we thought that insulin is not needed for uh, glucose metabolism and fuel metabolism in the brain. Then basic science studies, I mean, I wanted to show that here, you know, if you look at the brain and skeletal muscle, which I was concentrating for many years, only 2% of the body mass is by the brain. The brain uses about 20% of the glu uh, glucose and 20% energy expenditure in the body is uh, accounted by this 2% of the brain. Whereas 25% only used by 45% of the lean mass, showing that brain is a highly energy consuming organ about 60% endogenous glucose production in the fasted days is used 60-65% by the brain. At that time, muscle use mostly fatty acid. Muscle can spare the glucose. Muscle uses glucose uh, when glucose levels are high, especially post -prandial. So, 
there is evidence that accumulating evidence, uh, mitochondrial degeneration uh, in Parkinson disease and many other degenerative brain diseases. Insulin is a key regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis and function in skeletal muscle. Does brain, which likes skeletal muscle, is mostly a post mitotic tissue, also has insulin as a key regulator of mitochondrial function. So, this uh, is a paper from Ron Kahn's group. Various basic science studies have shown that uh, if you look at the brain, these areas, insulin receptors are high. If you look at, uh, you know, hypothalamus, hip, you know, hippocampus, uh, many cortical regions, especially frontal cortex, these region insulin receptors and IRS1 is high. So that means insulin is acting there. What does insulin do? What we did is, uh, does it in, has any effect on mitochondrial function just like in the muscle? So also these are the regions I want to show, same region where uh, Alzheimer's is affected. These regions are the regions where insulin receptors are high. So putting together, we hypothesize that uh, it may be a mitochondrial functional defect occurring there. So this one is uh, intranasally if you give insulin, you know that uh, CSF <coughs> insulin level goes higher than peripheral level. So that's one way increase in the CSF insulin level. When we did that a uh, mouse model, what we are seeing is uh, hippocampus, if you look at that's the main area of memory. And you can see that uh, the AKT phosphorylation, which is a clear measure of insulin action, and also the GSK1 beta phosphorylation both increases in the brain. Hippocamp hippocampus region. And uh, we also found uh, uh, the same region, the oxygen consumption increase. State three respiration, state four respiration doesn't change and the ATP production increase. So insulin delivered through intranasally increases ATP production in the brain. This is a mouse model, not human. And uh, we showed that uh, mitochondrial DNA copy numbers increase and also the, the key organ involved in mitochondrial biogenesis, species one alpha, that also increased. Showing that insulin directly involved in mitochondrial biogenesis and also mitochondrial function, same as in the skeletal muscle. So the next thing you want to see is uh, insulin deficiency. And uh, if you can see the citrus and this activity is uh, changing uh, in hippocampus, hypothalamus region and uh, not much in hippocampus, and uh, cytochrome C activity also changes. Uh, but when you come to H2O2 production, no significant change. Unlike in skeletal muscle, you know that substantial increase in the H2O2 production. That doesn't happen in insulin withdrawal in type 1 diabetes. And uh, if you look at uh, the SOD2 and catalase 2 antioxidant defense system, that goes up on insulin deprivation, whereas it muscle go down with oil of insulin. So brain is protected against uh, the active oxygen species uh, action in type 1 diabetes. It, insulin is withdrawn. So I'll show you the data. Insulin resistance is a different story. So we wanted to see why does it happen. So we know that insulin brain uses ketones. And there's evidence showing brain also can lease a lactic. So we know that uh, this particular uh, molecule in the blood brain barrier called monocarboxylase transporter, which is involved in the transport of ketones and lactate to the brain, which has been shown by others. So what we have shown is uh, insulin deficiency state. When you look at the brain, this, uh, this activity of this uh, MCT, which is involved in the transport of uh, ketones and lactate, that mRNA expression goes up. This hypothalamus and hippocampus. Okay. Hippocampus is mainly involved in the brain, which is a substantially important finding. And then we look at, uh, if you inhibit that, MCT action is inhibited. There are antibodies you can inhibit this action. When you do that, this protection is gone. The raw, the, it, raw submission increases on insulin withdrawal, whereas it doesn't go up in if the, this antibody is not used and state three respiration also increase and with the state four respiration substantially increasing, showing that brain is protected by 
in insulin deficiency state by this transporter system transporting ketones and lactate into the brain. You know that insulin deficiency state, ketone production increase in the periphery, lactate production increase. That's how brain is protected in type 1 diabetes patients. And uh, the result is, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, if uh, insulin withdrawal, SOD2 level goes up, that goes down on preventing this uh, transporter inhibitor and same thing catalase activity. So antioxidant defense system increases along with this uh, transport of ketones and lactate in the brain. So that way, that's probably the reason relatively protected uh, in type 1 diabetes brain damage by insulin deficiency. Well, if you use intranasal insulin receptor antagonist, you can create the same thing. Insulin receptor antagonists reduce uh, AKT phosphorylation, and there also this uh, uh, GSK beta phosphorylation, and H2O2 production increase, AT production decline, showing that insulin receptors, integrated insulin receptors are critical for those functions in the brain. So insulin resistance is, of course, there happening. And insulin resistance, we know that uh, uh, they ate the ketone production and the lactate production are inhibited by peripheral insulin insulin levels are high, that inhibit that. So they, don't, they are not transported into the brain. That's why type two diabetes patients, uh, at least the hypothesis, this anim animal study, it get a higher damage to the brain. I'll show the data on that. This is showing high fat diet induced mouse. You can see that ATP production goes down. And if you exercise them, this, uh, you know, chow fed mouse, if you exercise them, or high fat diet, both of them increase uh, brain ATP production. So exercise can prevent uh, high fat induced insulin resistance. Uh, same as muscle we have shown in PCO women, this can happen. And uh, again, it's 2 to production increases on high fat diet, which can be reduced by exercise. So it's not only in muscle, brain also this can happen. And uh, you can see that exercise prevent the mitochondrial DNA, mRNA, and same activities in the hippocampus following uh, high fat diet. High fat diet reduce mitochondrial DNA copy numbers, and also the PGs1 alpha 1 level and uh, citrus in this activity and uh, in hippocampus and also hippocampus, and uh, that can be prevented by exercise. Exercise also, you can see that this electron microscopy. Here, this is a normal sedentary animal, this high fat diet animal, mitochondrial connectivity between the mitochondria, that fusion is disrupted. Mitochondria is scattered. Exercise again reverses that to normal in brain. So, if you look at the oxidative damage here, you can see that uh, hippocampus and uh, you know, chow food animal versus high fat diet. The oxidative damage, the oxidative damage proteins, the red one, mostly mitochondrial protein, they increase the cell. And uh, when you exercise them, that's prevented. So in high fat diet induced insulin resistant, and uh, we hypothesize that same thing happen, insulin resistance in uh, obese people and other people, it's almost like high fat diet. They have high fat years in the circulation and uh, it may happen. You know, it happens in the areas where Alzheimer's are more prevalent. That's where we are trying to focus in that area. Well, how about metformin? Metformin improved insulin sensitivity. And you can see that the mouse, uh, high fat diet induced uh, mouse and pear fed mouse also, uh, you know, you can see that uh, in, this is a uh, body weight increases with its high fat diet induced animal. And, uh, you know, the, the the, the mouse, which are even normal diet, uh, doesn't happen. And metformin can prevent that happening. And uh, if you look at uh, oral GTD, you can see the same thing as you would expect. Metformin reduces, improves the insulin sensitivity. But citrate synthase activity, you can see that uh, goes down with a uh, high fat diet, and uh, then which can be prevented by metformin. And cytochrome C oxidase activity, ATP production also. Uh, reduces with the high fat diet, which can be prevented by aerobic, uh, sorry, the metformin. So this gave us uh, 
some suggestion that metformin may be effective, then you know that uh, a US study has all observation study show that uh, the black population which uh, take metformin for diabetes, they have less dementia. That's observation study. A Australian study showed uh, even a prospective study shows they have less dementia. And, but these are all small studies. So we are now supported by NIH. We are doing a double blind placebo control trial uh, to see whether brain changes. Uh, we look at uh, MR spectroscopy and volumetric MRI, PET scan, all of them we look at the brain to see if metformin does anything in combination with the cognitive study. But it's only a 40 week study because uh, you know cognitive function usually take longer time to really detect. We don't know the answer. By April end, by 40 people who complete the study, we'll unblind it and we'll have the answer, at least uh, any suggestion that metformin can do that. That case, this drug, which is used for more than for 50 years, despite all the new drug come, may still have a role. And uh, at least mouse study support that. This is one, I just want to show a small group where we did uh, three months of uh, aerobic exercise. What I'm showing is a uh, PET scan glucose uptake. These areas, every area in the brain involved with insulin sensitivity, there is a improvement, but not significant because of a small group and a three month study. But this area, we found a significant difference. Showing that even a three months of exercise in a healthy people with no insulin resistance, glucose uptake can be improved in these areas by exercise program. So not surprisingly, the American College of Academy of Neurology says that improved memory for people with mild cognitive impairment, only thing which is effective now is uh, aerobic exercise. Even a 30 minutes walk has some effect. Sitting and uh, seeing television and all won't do that. So it, there is no substitute exercise, not only for your heart, muscle, brain, all the vascular system. So that's one of my main conclusion. I leave it there and I want to thank uh, people who really did the studies. Uh, my role is to come up with ideas and get the design study and many of my fellows and technical staff, they are responsible for doing it. I want specifically want to, the last, uh, the nature communication paper done by these two people, Jin Ho is back in South Korea now as a faculty. Matthew Robinson is a successful faculty in the University of, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Oregon State University. Ian Lance uh, continue in Mayo and he has an independent lab and uh, uh, continuing a successful research. And many of these people, and I, of course, um, this core labs all supported by Mayo Clinic. Uh, I started this metabolomic program and uh, there's a healthy living center Mayo where we can exercise people. And uh, so Mayo Foundation has been very generous in supporting me. And I had, uh, I think almost 34 years continuous grant from NIDDK and uh, Aging Institute provide a lot of grant led to aging study. So these are things make things happen. And uh, I want to acknowledge that and thank you very much. We'd be happy to answer any question. So, Dr. Nair, yeah. I have a bunch of questions for you. Sure. Uh, as usual, fantastic talk and very inspiring. Uh, just a question, because you talked about the uh, PPR gamma receptors and the relationship to mitochondrial function. Yeah. So, would using thiazolidine dions actually improve mitochondrial function? Uh, which one? Thiazolidine dions. Yeah, you know... Uh... We wanted to do a study, but the problem is uh, that's uh, really pg and alpha-1 and alpha-4 bind to that. Uh, and because uh, pg one alpha pg one has no receptors in the uh, nuclear membrane. So I need a helper. That helping role is only one that's doing it. So we don't know. I think uh, we wanted to do a study and, uh, you know, at least in animal model, actually Jinho now got a grant which I am a collaborator in uh, South Korea. He is planning to do something on that line. A PPR gamma and PPR beta stimulant, can it, can it do that? And that's a question we are trying to answer. And uh, we don't know the long-term human data, you know. Uh, 
the other question was in connection with uh, I was fascinated with the photograph which you'd shown about the large mammals and the small mammals. Yes. The rodents and how the muscle mass in rodents in terms of, you know, the proximal muscles is actually much less compared to the primates. Uh, but some of the, some certain animals like birds, for example, uh, they are really very vigorous in the activity and they obviously generate a lot of uh, energy when they do this, like hummingbirds or whatever. Yeah, hummingbird, uh, good that you mentioned. So, they have thousand times more mitochondrial capacity than human. And where are they located? Uh, where are they located? Because I, mean, I think it's, uh, you know, they are wing muscles. And uh, there are a lot of studies done on them. Again, another thing I would say that we are the, I was the first one to show that, uh, uh, you know, if you infuse glucagon in the somatostatin infused state, the glucagon level goes up, your energy expenditure goes up. Same way, withdrawal of insulin in type 1 diabetes, energy expenditure go, go up. If you infuse somatostatin, inhibit the glucagon, that goes down. Then you replace glucone, it goes up again. So glucone is the thermogenic hormone. And when you and I published that paper, I got a uh, letter from a French investigator on animals. They said that uh, he has shown that many uh, sort of Antarctic-based animals uh, and uh, birds, uh, mainly birds, uh, they all have high glucone level. And uh, he also showed me some data showing this birds buy at a high level when it's very cold. Their body, you know, body uh, temp temperature is maintained by thermogenesis, and glucone is responsible for that. So yes, uh, they are producing a lot of uh, energy, and they have very high mitochondrial capacity, as you know, highest as high hummingbird. You rightly touch on that one. When you talk about exercise as beneficial for mitochondrial activity. And this perhaps pertains more to the upcoming talks by our colleagues from pediatric neurology and also from endocrinology and cases. In the management of mitochondrial disorders, would low intensity physical exercise actually be good? Uh, high intensity exercise may precipitate lactic acidosis. And yeah. We'd be worried about that. But would low intensity exercise actually be beneficial for mitochondrial activity in my mitochondria which have underlying pathological problems? Well, not enough data. <laughs> and also, if you look at uh, Vasmati Mota, who has done a lot of studies, uh, uh, is in uh, uh, MGH uh, work, is a physician MGH, and also in uh, Broad Institute in MIT. Uh, he showed me some data showing that, in fact, uh, the only way to prevent many of the mitochondrial diseases uh, progressing is prevent the ROS emission. And this can be done by reducing the oxygen and he showed some data, which is uh, not very strong data, previously published uh, by some Indian authors based on uh, the people living in Himalayas. Uh, they have low oxygen tension. And uh, they say that uh, they may, he, he showed some data based on that, that may provide some protection to the mitochondria. Uh, that means uh, his idea is uh, the children with uh, low, uh, mitochondrial function probably reduce maybe physical activities may not help them if the active physical activity they have produce more rows and also lactate production increase. <coughs> and uh, but that's a purely hypothesis and i don't think any studies have been done and uh, you know there may be based on this data maybe some ethical issues uh, if you try to do that uh, you know <coughs> we haven't done that we have a registry of <coughs> mitochondrial diabetes in Mayo. I haven't done much uh, this sort of studies on them, but that's an important question. You know, in fact, Vasmati Mota and we used to discuss several times whether we should do something like that. He theoretically is opposed to that idea. He thinks uh, reducing oxygen tension may make them live a longer period of normal life. That's what he thinks. But it's, again, this speculation, hypothesis. One last <laughs> methodological question. When doing many of your studies, you're taking muscle biopsies as, now I realize the preconditions for doing muscle biopsies and looking at mitochondrial activity are actually pretty rigorous. Would proteomics be a substitute for some of these experiments uh, which you're doing? Well, we do, many of these studies, we also do metabolomics and proteomics. This is recently doing a lot of RNA sequence also, but, uh, 
functional studies cannot be substituted by proteome measurement. Uh, again, proteome measurement is still <coughs> not as uh, uh, precise as uh, functional studies or even metabolomics. In fact, metabolomics may be slightly better in that respect. So when you do the muscle biopsy, we use mitochondria DNA copy number. We look at, I done a study on three generation of women. As I mentioned, mitochondria DNA is inherited from mother to daughter. And, uh, you know, there is this uh, very strong group uh, who hypothesize that aging is simply because mitochondria DNA mutation occurs. They show, uh, you know, so much heterogeneity there and heteroplasmy. And what they show is uh, uh, one group of people, other people, there is some more uh, mitochondrial DNA chains occurring with the age. And, uh, but uh, that's not enough to establish that point. Prospective study is not easy in human. So what I did was we got 16 families without uh, any diseases, grandmother, daughter and granddaughter. Three of them we did the study. What we found was uh, we did look at complete mitochondria DNA uh, sequencing, sequencing based on uh, you know the array system. What we found was that uh, we cannot find uh, any evidence of uh, muscle-related changes uh, attributed to mitochondria DNA mutation. Only two or three uh, you know genes involved in the the D loop system. Nothing you know, sort of a protein encoding when it's affected by aging. So aging cannot be explained on based on mitochondria DNA mutation, but mitochondria DNA damage occurs, DNA copy number declined with the grandmother as the lowest, highest for the granddaughter. So that happened consistently. So what I believe is uh, when mitochondria damage occurs, the mitochondria is degraded and the exercise only can improve the you know, sort of biogenesis of mitochondrial DNA through the PG sun alpha pathway I mentioned. And if you don't do that, DNA copy numbers decline. And uh, we have other studies showing that uh, people who regularly run, uh, sorry, long distance bikers, four years they are doing it, at least four days a week. Uh, compared to young and old people, both aerobically trained people, untrained people, insulin sensitivity is purely related to exercise. Aging, older people exercise and they don't have any insulin resistance. We also found mitochondrial function can be well maintained by exercise. The older people regularly exercise and their mitochondrial DNA copy number, ATP production is same as the young people who do not exercise. They cannot reach the same level as young people who are regularly exercising. But if you can get somebody 25 year old sedentary person's mitochondrial DNA capacity when you are 75 years old, that's not a bad deal. So that way, I think it's, uh, uh, yes, DNA, you know, you can do a lot of studies on mitochondria, uh, but you need a tissue and blood cells don't reflect that at all. That's a, there's no substitute to that. And the same thing may be true with the brain versus muscle. When you show the muscle, you may not be the same thing in the brain. And animal studies support that. But the brain, the only way you look at is a, you know, MR, phosphorus MR spectroscopy or volumetric MRI or functional MRI, look at the connectivity. And uh, I believe that the ATP level goes down, the connectivity also declines. That's the reason some of the function can be affected. Do you recommend any vitamins like we give for uh, mitochondrial diseases, we give uh, mega vitamins? Well, I think, you know, in general, my, my view about uh, supplementation is that unless you have a reason, uh, there is a deficiency, there's no reason. Right? And there's no study showing that uh, in mitochondrial disease, uh, vitamin may help or CQ or any of this will help. The, no prospective study showing that. So that way, I don't think there's any evidence of that. As a matter of fact, if you are a person eating healthy diet, and if you exercise, Taking high dose of uh, antioxidants may be prevent the antioxidant defense system. Animal studies show that. Some tantalizing data, human studies also showing that. So if you take a, a normal healthy diet, then supplement may probably prevent some of the normal antioxidant defense system increase occurring with exercise.
yeah well one of the problems is you know, vegetables provide fruits provide lot of uh, uh, water soluble vitamins but the cooking if you boil and throw away the water you are <laughs> removing all the, those vitamins so that's one of the things people should consider and uh, so thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Anyway, it is a pleasure. There's some more questions. Uh, some if you questions. Would like oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll be happy to answer this. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Dr. Jeetan has asked, uh, can MitoQ and PQQ increase mitochondrial fusion and fission and therefore improve energy output in most cells in a diabetic with mitochondrial dysfunction? Can this help patients with uh, ESRD, CKD, because the tubules are extremely mitochondria dense? Well, my short answer is uh, there is no clear evidence of that. You know, none of the studies have shown it will help them. Again, creatine is something proposed. So in the absence of any uh, prospective study data, especially double blind placebo control data, I wouldn't recommend that. Also, he is asked, can ketones be used as a primary source of energy mostly and therefore bypass the challenges that glucose brings in and let insulin behave and help in insulin resistant challenges? Will this help in reversing many states of insulin resistance? You know, that's an important question as I have shown, you know, ketones, uh, brain can use it. But ketone levels, when very high, only can cross, you know, change the enzyme system, can drink and use it. But, uh, uh, you know, there's a keto, ketotic diet, which also results in weight loss. But there's also data showing that uh, that type of diet that may also increase the calcium excretion in the urine. And uh, we don't know the long term effect. In general, uh, many comparative studies show that they both are, you know, something like a low calorie diet, any type, especially the Mediterranean type of diet uh, and the ketone, high, sorry, ketone producing diet, both of them, weight loss is similar, but long-term benefits, uh, there's no data, if at all, data suggests that uh, this uh, ketosis, uh, high ketosis diet, which may provide a lot of saturated fatty acid and may be damaged. So I don't recommend my patients to take uh, that diet. I recommend them to take a, uh, more of a something similar to a Mediterranean diet, which is very similar to some of the vegetarian diet with a lot of legumes and uh, you fuse the right oil and so that's probably the, the or a couple of other type of diets, uh, including a mayo diet program, which is appears, they are all healthier diet. In the absence, other one theoretical, you know, my patients come and ask me, many of the supermarkets there, there's uh, this, uh, what you call a virgin <laughs> coconut oil. People drink it, thinking that they'll increase the ketones in the brain and prevent the dementia. It's a good theory, but it's not data supporting it. I wouldn't say don't do it, but I don't know that. I don't have any data to support it. Last question by him. What role does leptin play in managing insulin? Uh, so after that, I think maybe because of lack of time, the email can be given and they can ask the question. So last question is, what role does leptin play in managing insulin? Well, uh, leptin deficiency is associated with insulin resistance. The classical example is uh, lipodystrophy. Lipodystrophy, when the fat is uh, depleted in the body, they are severely insulin resistant and fatty acid can cause a lot of triglyceride accumulation in the liver, a major problem can occur. If you give leptin, insulin sensitivity improves. So almost clears this fatty acid, triglyceride accumulation in the liver. And that's well known. But insulin resistant people who are obese, their leptin level is high. So that way giving more leptin won't help. This condition, certainly, you know, lipodystrophy. And there is also data showing that the animal motor lipodystrophy, if you transplant the fat tissue, their insulin sensitivity improves. Fat is not bad, but too much of fat is bad because inflammation and all that. But people who are insulin resistant with the leptin level high, there's no point in giving them more leptin. That doesn't help. One last, One last question. Like, yeah, so the data, most of the data was in the presence or absence of insulin. Uh, but most of the most of the patients with type 2 diabetes, we see hyperinsulinemia. Do you have any data with 
high levels of insulin. Well, you know that uh, the exercise study I showed is uh, their insulin level is high. And most type two diabetes patients we study insulin level is uh, normal or high. And you know that the early stage uh, type two diabetes patients are high insulin, especially obese one. This PC of women have high insulin. So it's a question of insulin action. You know, insulin action is reduced. And that high insulin can have an adverse effect in the sense <laughs> that uh, that inhibit uh, ketogenesis and lactate production. So that way there's some protection uh, you know, benefit to the brain, as opposed to insulin, transient insulin withdrawal in type 1 diabetes, ketones are like that cross the blood brain barrier and stimulate the antioxidant defense system and provide substrate for the brain functions. So that doesn't happen when the insulin levels are high. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And there are many more questions. You so, um, our <coughs> next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Sangeeta, and uh, we all know that Dr. Sangeeta is uh, uh, is here in pediatric neurology. She is a professor. Uh, she joined the faculty as uh, in the department in two thousand and thirteen after completing her DM in pediatric neurology from AIMS in New Delhi. And she did her uh, MD pediatrics from uh, ICH and Hospital for Children, Madras uh, Medical College, Chennai. And her areas of interest are epilepsy, neurometabolic disorders, neuro uh, infection, and neuroinflammatory disorders. She's a brilliant person and I have interacted so well with her. And I'm delighted to have Dr. Uh, Sangeeta for the next talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the... Uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll be discussing uh, about the Lake syndrome spectrum. There are many phases of mitochondrial disorders. So one is uh, Lake syndrome spectrum, which includes the Lake disease and the Lake-like disease. So there are more than 350 genes which have been implicated in uh, mitochondrial disorders. And uh, mitochondrial disorder is one which has a bigenomic inheritance. You know that uh, we can have a nuclear gene mediated disorder as well as a mitochondrial uh, uh, genes mediated disorder as well. So the Lake syndrome spectrum, majority of them are caused by the nuclear genes. 70% of them are caused by mutations in nuclear genes and 30% of them are caused by mutations in the mitochondrial genes. So among the many mitochondrial disorders which causes neurological manifestations, Lake syndrome spectrum is one of the commonest uh, 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 phenotype which we often encounter in our clinical practice. So Lake syndrome is a devastating neurodegenerative disorder uh, which usually manifests in infancy and childhood. It was originally described by a neuropathologist uh, Denise Lake in 1951. Initially, it was thought to be a dysfunction of time and metabolism because of its resemblance to Wernicke's encephalopathy. But later, it's linked to the mitochondrial energy metabolism was discovered and uh, it has evolved into a definite clinical radiological entity. The hallmarks of uh, Lake syndrome are uh, they present with a definite cognitive and uh, the deterioration of uh, cognitive as well as the motor functions. And they have symmetrical lesions in the basal ganglia and brainstem on the imaging. And often the diagnosis is confirmed by the uh, genetic testing, often which includes the whole exome and the mitochondrial genome sequencing. The estimated incidence has found to be varying, varying from different studies. Uh, it has reported from 1 in uh, 5,000 to 1 in 10,000 live births. So Lake syndrome is often uh, diagnosed uh, by the criteria uh, where you'll have the where when patients present with a progressive neurological disease with the uh, motor intellectual uh, regression, and they have signs and symptoms of brainstem or basal ganglia involvement. Uh, they are often present with movement disorders, ataxia. They can present with uh, uh, cognitive decline. And uh, uh, biochemically, if you see, they can have elevated blood and CSF lactate. And also, they can have one of the following features, uh, the typical MRI findings, which involves the brainstem and basal ganglia, and postmortem findings of uh, typical neuropathological changes, or there, are, there is a previous documented neuropathological findings in an affected sibling. 
So Lake syndrome spectrum includes both Lake syndrome as well as Lake-like syndrome. Lake-like syndrome is a, uh, is a condition where you have an overall clinical picture which resembles like a Lake syndrome, but the clinical criteria is not completely met. And there are often uh, atypical radiological laboratory and uh, clinical features. So this sir uh, has already covered in detail. Uh, so uh, the most important function of the mitochondria is the energy metabolism. So this is mediated through the, uh, uh, through the complexes one to four, which is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So the energy which is pro produced by the transfer of electron across the uh, electron transport chain uh, results in the uh, driving of protons, which uh, ultimately results in the synthesis of ATP. So if you could see that com among complex one to four, complex one, now one is the largest, uh, largest complex. And uh, it is, uh, there is a, a huge a set of genes which have been implicated uh, in the synthesis of synthesis and assembly of uh, uh, complex one. So uh, here you can see a huge list of uh, genes, nuclear genes, uh, which are implicated to cause uh, Lake syndrome spectrum. So 70% of them are caused by the nuclear genes and 30% of them are caused by the mitochondrial genes. More than 80 genes have been implicated and has been identified so far in uh, causing a Lake syndrome spectrum. So uh, these genes can cause directly uh, impact on the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, or they can have impact on the other mitochondrial functions such as mitochondrial DNA maintenance, translation, altered mitochondrial dynamics, and uh, other, other nuclear translocation system. So uh, as I mentioned already, uh, a small percentage, around 30% uh, of them are caused by the mitochondrial genes, which includes point mutation, small deletions, <coughs> DNA rearrangements, and depletion syndromes. So children with Lake syndrome often manifest with uh, symptoms uh, uh, pertaining to three major systems, which, is, which includes the muscle, eye, and the brain. And the other systems which are often uh, uh, involved or includes cardiac system, gastrointestinal system, hepatological system, renal disorders, sensorineural deafness, and hematological disorders. So how to diagnose or suspect a Lake syndrome in practice uh, when, when there is a typical uh, onset of uh, neurological deterioration after a period of metabolic stress, which includes an infection or a febrile illness. And the, the children can have a pre-existing developmental delay and they can have they can present with a uh, loss of acquired milestones, and they can have a parental consanguinity with a positive family history in a sibling earlier, and a mother can have a post, a recurrent abortions uh, in the past, and uh, in you in you always need to exclude the closest differentials based on the imaging findings, uh, which includes the kernicterus sequelae, carbon monoxide poisoning, or the encephalitis uh, in the appropriate clinical settings. The physical examination, you, you, you have to look for the signs of basal ganglia and brainstem involvement, which in, involves them, which includes the movement disorders and cerebellar symptoms, autonomic dysfunction, peripheral neuropathy. They can also have certain uh, clues like failure to thrive, sensorineural deafness, and hypertrichosis on the examination. So the laboratory parameters include the presence of elevated blood or CSF lactate. Sometimes you can have elevated both blood and CSF lactate. They can have elevated plasma al alanine levels. And the urine organic acid may show elevated pyruvate and lactate or any of the TCA metabolites. And acyl carnitine esters can have characteristic elevation in certain mitochondrial disorders. Also, you need to screen for the involvement of other systems like cardiac, uh, renal, as well as the liver. And they can have elevation of CPK if there is a muscle involvement and plasma ammonia may be elevated in, uh, during the crisis. So the MRI brain and MRS may show symmetrical lesions involving the basal ganglia and the brainstem without without involvement of the supratentorial white matter and the mrs may show lactate peak in many of the patients and genetic testing has to be decided based on the clinical phenotype so uh, if the phenotype is uh, clear then you can go ahead with the nuclear gene testing or the mitochondrial uh, dna sequencing depending upon the clinical phenotype if the phenotype is unclear then you have to go for a whole exome sequencing along with the mitochondrial genome sequencing so uh, using some illustrative cases which we have managed in our unit, I'll be discussing few of this uh, disorders uh, in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway defect. So first we look into a patient with a complex deficiency. This is a four year old boy who presented to our uh, unit. He was born to third degree consanguineous parents. He was brought for evaluation of delayed milestones, predominantly motor adomai. At the three and a half years of age, he had presented with a febrile illness with the altered sensorium for three days and he was managed elsewhere. And after recovery from the febrile illness, he has developed regression of uh, progressive regression of the motor milestones and also had a generalized tremulousness. 
Uh, antenatal history, there were no risk factors. Perinatally, he was born full term with a low birth weight. And there was no, fam no family history of similar illness in the siblings. Examination wise, he had, uh, he had failure to thrive and also had microcephaly. And you can see there is a generalized wasting and he, has he had hypertrichosis as well. His higher mental functions were normal. Uh, on cradle love examination, he had bilateral convergence squint and also had a horizontal nystagmus. There was a generalized wasting with a hypotonia with hyporeflexia. And also he had cerebellar signs in the form of titubation, head titubation and intentional tremor. So this child uh, was brought for evaluation here and he had an intercurrent infection and he presented with a, a decompensation to the pediatric casualty. And he had, uh, he had respiratory acidosis uh, with a pH of 7 and PCO2 of 87. And his arterial lactate was very much elevated. It was 6.9. And urine organic acid analysis by GCMS revealed an elevated lactate peak. His blood ammonia was normal and acyl carnitine screening test was non-contributory. While he was admitted, in a, admitted with us in the ward for the management of the decompensation, we uh, did the other uh, uh, investigations to rule out the other sites of neuroaccess involvement. Nerve conduction studies revealed uh, demyelinating sensory motor polyneuropathy and also BERA revealed bilateral auditory pathway dysfunction. So this child was managed appropriately for the crisis. And this is the imaging which, which shows symmetrical involvement of the cerebellar white matter, dentate nuclei, and also in the medulla involving the olivary nuclei. And also you can see there is an involvement of the midbrain and also patchy involvement of the putamen and the caudate. There was no diffusion rest restriction of the corresponding sites on the MRI and the MRS did not reveal any lactate peak. So this child, we proceeded with the genetic testing and we identified a homozygous pathogenic variant and the exon 8 of SERF1 gene, confirming the diagnosis of complex for deficiency, uh, which caused the Lake syndrome. So complex for deficiency is one of the commonest cause of uh, Lake syndrome in children. And uh, uh, because of the complex four deficiency, the children can manifest with a varied, uh, with a varied clinical phenotypes. The common phenotype includes the developmental delay with regression following an intercurrent illness, and they present with uh, hypotonia, areflexia or hyporeflexia, movement disorders, epilepsy, and if you look at the uh, overall phenotype, the, most of them have like feeding difficulties with failure to thrive with hypertrichosis, and they can have other systemic involvement like tubulopathy, cardiomyopathy, and respiratory failure. So biochemically, they can have elevated blood or CSF lactate. They can present with metabolic acidosis and they can have peripheral neuropathy. And they have the typical MRI uh, lesions, which is often diagnostic uh, uh, in many of our patients. And if you do a muscle biopsy, there may be absent uh, COX activity. So this child was managed with mitochondrial COX type. So initially during the first crisis, he recovered, but subsequently during an decompensation, he, ha uh, he, he had a respiratory failure, required ventilation, and he, uh, he, he was not able to wean off a ventilation, and then he succumbed. So this child was initially managed with a mitochondrial cock type, but most of the children with the surf mutation, the life expectancy is less than five years, and they usually uh, succumb to integral illness. So looking at the next category of disorders, the defects in the synthesis of uh, cofactors and en uh, enzymes, which are essential for the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. A nine month old girl, second born to non consanguineous parents was brought for evaluation of delayed developmental milestones. She developed epileptic spasms since six months of age, and she had regression of all milestones after the onset of epileptic spasms. Uh, mother had perinatal risk factors in the form of uh, PIH and hypothyroidism, and there was two spontaneous first trimester abortion in the past. She was born full term by LSES, and her birth weight was uh, uh, like she had a low birth weight. And examination wise, uh, her head circumference was on the lower centile, and she had a dysmorphic state. If you can see that she has hypertelorism, depressed nasal bridge, antiverted nostrils, and a long philtrum. And she was uh, having autistic traits and also hypotonia with uh, brisk deep tendon reflexes. Uh, there was no movement disorders and no cerebellar system involvement in this child and systemic examination was normal. So this child, we proceeded with the investigation considering the possibility of a, a cryptogenic West syndrome. The metabolic workup revealed borderline elevation of blood lactate and urine GCMS revealed elevated glutaric acid, alpha ketoglutaric acid and other metabolites of the TCA cycle. EEG revealed modified hypsarrhythmia. So the imaging, you could see there is a hyperintensity of the bilateral globus pallidus, and there was a diffuse cortical atrophy, and there was a diffuse thinning of the corpus callosum. The areas which were bright on T2-weighted images, there was diffusion restriction on the DWI. 
and MRS did not reveal any lactate peak. Because of the symmetrical involvement of the basal ganglia, we considered a metabolic uh, a disorder a high possibility in this child. And we kept her, uh, we initiated the child on the mitochondrial cocktail because of the elevated blood lactate, and we sent the genetic testing, which shall reveal the variant of uncertain significance heteros in the heterozygous state of uh, exon 12 of PDHA1 gene, uh, suggesting a possibility of pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. And this gene was validated in the parents, both parents of wild type, and this was a de, de, de novo mutation in this child. So this child, the epilepsy was controlled after optimization of anti medications. She was given vigabatrin and planacipa, and she was also initiated in high-dose thiamine and carnitine along with ketogenic diet. She, she became seizure-free, and she has got good developmental gains, and her EEG also uh, had a no resolution of the hypsarrhythmia. So this, this is the defect here. Um, pyruvate dehydrogenase is the enzyme, which is essential for the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle. So the pyruvate dehydrogenase is a uh, it, it 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 has a, it's an aggregate of three enzymes. One is the pyruvate dehydrogenase itself. Another is the DLAT and DLD. So when you have a mutations in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the uh, the conversion of a pyruvate to acetyl CoA is inhibited, and as a result of it, you have a defect in the energy uh, energy pathway. So the phenotype in pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency uh, it is variable. They can present in the neonatal age with congenital lactic acidosis or they can present with refractory seizures, or in adults, they can manifest like a myopathy or ataxia. So this, our child, in, uh, in Proban had a developmental delay with epilepsy, with a hypsarrhythmia, and also had an imaging finding of dysgenesis of corpus callosum. So the imaging findings can also give an underlying clue for PDH deficiency. They often have a dysgenesis or agenesis of corpus callosum without, without involvement of the basal ganglia and the brainstem. So if you see in the pathway, because of the inhibition of the conversion of pyruvate to the acetyl-CoA, the pyruvate and lactate will be elevated in the blood. So the, you can see in the CSF and urine and the blood, there can be elevated pyruvate and lactate. And you can see a low PDH enzyme activity in the culture fibroblast. So uh, the treatment is initiation of ketogenic diet and also initiation of high dose of thiamine. So this is one of the treatable causes of uh, uh, mitochondrial uh, disorder where you can have a good outcome uh, on initiation of the ketogenic diet. So we look into another uh, case of uh, defect in the biosynth uh, biosynthesis of cofactors and uh, enzymes. A three-month-old girl, third born to third degree consanguineous uh, uh, parents, was uh, brought for a history of uh, fever with excessive irritability. He, wa he was encephalopathic when he presented to us, and he also he had polymorphic seizures in the form of myoclonic jerks, as well as focal motor seizures, which was, uh, which was refractory to the anti-seizure medications. So mother conceived after an IVF treatment. There was a previous uh, positive family history. First child was healthy. Second child had a similar presentation in the infantile period. Subsequent to their recovery from the febrile illness, he had a global delay with refractory seizures and had an extra pyramidal involvement. And he succumbed to an intercurrent illness at 18 months of age. So the, uh, uh, this proban, when we, uh, on examination, he was encephalopathic and he had spasticity with generalized dystonia and uh, with the brisk deep tendon reflexes when he presented to us. So he was admitted in pediatric ward and uh, during the decompensation, he had severe metabolic acidosis and blood lactate was very much elevated. And urine GS GCMS revealed elevated lactic acid <coughs> and uh, rest of the parameters were not, not contributory. So imaging was the one which gave us the diagnosis in this child. Uh, this child had a symmetrical involvement of cerebellar white matter and vermian involvement. And also in addition to that, the child has thalamic as well as the symmetrical involvement of the basal ganglia with swelling, carded putamen with swelling. So in addition to that, you can see in the supratentorial white matter at the gray white junction. So you can see there is a symmetrical swelling as well as hyperintensity. So those areas which are appearing hyperintense on T2 weighted images were showing diffusion restriction on the DWI. So this child, we considered the possibility of a biotin time and responsive basal ganglia disease based on the classical imaging findings. And we initiated the child on biotin and time and high dose of biotin time and high dose in the sense it is normally when you suspect a biotin is deficiency, you tend to give five to 10 milligram per day. For biotin time and basal ganglia disease, you tend to give a very high dose, five to 10 milligram per kg per day. And time and you tend to give one, 10 to 40 milligram per kg per day. So this child we initiated on biotin and time in, and we have sent for the genetic studies, which, have, which has revealed a likely pathogenic variant in the exon three of SLC19A3 gene, confirming the diagnosis of biotin time and responsive basal ganglia disorder in this child. 
though this child was initiated on management early, he was one of the child who was, who was presented with an uh, onset of symptoms in the early infancy. So he really did not uh, have a complete uh, clinical resolution of symptoms. Though there was a significant radiological resolution, the swelling of supratenteral white matter have come down. There was a cortical atrophy and there was a basal ganglia loss, uh, volume loss, and there was a res uh, residual signal changes in the basal ganglia and thalamide. So this is the video of this child at follow-up. So you can see there is a significant axial hypotonia and he was uh, still on NG feeds and he had a generalized dystonia despite optimization of uh, antidystonic medications and on adequate dose of biotin and thiamine. So biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglia disorder again had uh, three cl classical phenotypes. One is the infantile onset one. So uh, where they present with the uh, poor feeding, lethargy, and lactic acidosis. And the other classical onset one between three to 10 years where they, where they present with encephalopathy, seizures, and movement disorders, or the adult onset variants where they present like a Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy. So what is the basic metabolism defect here is where the, uh, the uh, vitamin time and basal ganglia disorder, the mutation occurs in SLC19A3 gene. This gene is essential for the transport of thiamine into the cytoplasm. So once the thiamine enters into the cytoplasm, it is converted into active form TPP, thiamine pyrophosphate. So thiamine pyrophosphate is a, a coenzyme for many of the enzymes, uh, many of the cofactor for many of the enzymes. One is the transketolase, another is the PDH, another is the alpha keto acid dehydrogenase. So when you have a defect in the transport of thiamine into the cell, there will be a defect in the function of these enzymes, uh, these key enzymes, which as a result of which you have an energy failure. So the diagnosis is often established based on the typical imaging findings. The TMS and GCMS may remain normal in these cases. And the treatment often includes the avoidance of the catabolic stress and supplementation of high dose of biotin and thiamine. When these children who are on high dose of biotin and thiamine present with a metabolic decompensation, you have to double the dose of biotin and thiamine during the decompensation. So we'll look into another patient uh, with the mitochondrial translation disorders. This is a two and a half year old girl uh, born to third degree consanguineous parents. She was brought for the evaluation of delayed milestones and squint, which was noticed since infancy. Mother had multiple risk factors, hypothyroidism. She also had uh, fetal hypokinesia and she has conceived after an ovulation induction drug. So uh, the child was delivered full term uh, with a normal birth weight and there was no perinatal asphyxia. So when she presented to us, she was able to walk with support, but she had unsteadiness while walking. And mother reported recurrent episodes of breath holding spells and frequent episodes of operation. She also reported free, poor feeding and lethargy with intercurrent illness requiring hospitalization on and off. So examination wise, child had microcephaly and uh, weight and le length were less than third centile. She had a bilateral ptosis and optic atrophy on fundus examination. She also had wide based stands with ataxic gait. And also you can see that is a generalized wasting. And she also had hypotonia with hyperreflexia. If you carefully observe it, you can see the nystagmus as well. So this child on metabolic uh, testing, she had acidosis with elevated blood lactate and ur urine GCMS revealed elevated lactate and elevated TCA metabolites. So imaging in this child, you can see there is a symmetrical hyperintensity in the medulla as well as in the uh, oculomotor nuclei, as well as subthalamic nuclei with the diffusion restriction on the DWI. There was no peak on the MR, lactate peak on the MRS. So this child, considering the possibility of a Lake syndrome spectrum, we did a genetic testing, which has revealed a pathogenic homozygous variant and the exon 3 of C12OR of 65, confirming the diagnosis of combined oxidative phosphorylation deficiency 7. So this child was initiated on mitochondrial cocktail and currently she is remaining stable, though she has not uh, shown a much clinical improvement in terms of uh, gain of milestones, uh, she's remaining static. There are no further decompensation with intercurrent illness. So mitochondrial translation defects are caused by mutations in tRNA gene or rRNA mutations or ribosomal protein mutation. The phenotype is highly variable. They often present with spastic paraparesis, they can present with a peripheral neuropathy, optic atrophy, or a lake like syndrome. Moving on to next patient of uh, mitochondrial uh, defect in the nuclear genes that can uh, have an impact on the other mitochondrial functions. A four-year-old child, uh, second born to non-consanguineous parents, was brought for the evaluation of delay in attaining milestones since early infancy. 
she had progressive stiffness in the lower limbs since infancy and also she had loss of milestones following an intercurrent illness at three years of age. So, uh, the mother reported recurrent episodes of diarrheal illness since early infancy requiring hospitalization. On examination, the child had hypopigmented hair. Her, well, her head circumference was uh, a less than third centile. And also she had acrocyanosis on examination. She had spasticity of both all four limbs and also had bilateral ankle clonus with extensive plantar response. And she also had mild, mild intermittent dystonia. So based on the clinical phenotype, uh, we suspected a mitochondrial disorder in this child and we proceeded with the metabolic testing, which revealed elevated blood lactate and urine organic acid revealed very much elevated ethyl melonic acid. And also acyl carnitine screening test uh, 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 was suggestive of an <coughs> elevation in the C4 acyl carnitine ester. So based on the clinical phenotype and the biochemical testing, we considered the possibility, uh, possibility of ethyl melonic acidemia in this child. And MRI was showing P2 weighted hyperintensity, faint hyperintensity in the bilateral chordate as well as putamen. So the genetic testing confirmed the diagnosis. Uh, it revealed a pathogenic homozygous variant in the exon 4 of ETHE1 gene, uh, confirming the diagnosis of ethyl melonic acidemia or ethyl melonic encephalopathy. So ethyl melonic encephalopathy is often caused by mutation in ETHE1 gene. So as a result of the mutation in ETHE1 gene, you have accumulation of dihydrogen sulfide within the cells. So as a result of the accumulation of sulfide, it inhibits the uh, short chain acyl coa dehydrogenase and FOX activity leading on to energy failure. So the classical symptomatology is developmental delay with regression and they can have other system involvement in the form of PTK purpure. They can have acrocyanosis because of the endothelial injury and they can also have hemorrhagic suffusion of mucosal surfaces resulting in chronic diarrhea or dysentery. So urine GCMS often gives the diagnosis. It will reveal elevated ethyl melonic acid and TMS can uh, show elevated C4, C5 acyl carnitine esters. So MRI also shows symmetrical changes in the basal ganglia without, without involvement of the brainstem. And the treatment options include supplementation of n cysteine, where, uh, where, where, uh, where, the, uh, where it can act as a, a receptor for the sulfur uh, uh, atoms within the uh, cell. And metronidazole also can be helpful because metronidazole will reduce the sulfide produ producing bacterial load in the intestine. So this child was initiated on n cysteine and metronidazole and uh, uh, she has not shown further decompensation and she's under follow up with us. So uh, to conclude, Lake syndrome spe spectrum is a clinical as well as genetically heterogeneous neurological disorder. It results from mutations in both nuclear as well as the mitochondrial genes. They predominantly manifest with neurological uh, syndrome. Uh, they can have other system involvement in the form of cardiac, hepatic, gastrointestinal, and renal involvement. Diagnosis is often based on the imaging findings as well as the biochemical parameters. And very rarely we do muscle biopsy nowadays because often it is supported by the genetic diagnosis. And treatable causes of Lake syndrome spectrum include PDH deficiency, coenzyme Q deficiency, and biotin thiamine are responsive basal ganglia disorders. And these shouldn't be missed. And these often have a definite diagnostic clues based on the clinical phenotype and the biochemical parameters. I would like to thank our clinical team and the lab team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Quickly, we can uh, one or two questions. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, if you can do the in utero diagnosis, you mean the CRISPR based correction of the gene, can it be done for the day syndrome? I know there are some mitochondrial syndromes. Uh, this has been done in, in some ways, like aging blood. So, uh, the, with regard to the prenatal diagnosis, I think ma'am would be able to set a, tell it better. Yeah, we are doing the prenatal diagnosis generally. We are uh, because many of them are not financially capable of continuing the treatment, and uh, it's a hospital visit off and on. So many people actually prefer for prenatal diagnosis if the if it is a nuclear gene and there is an autosomal recessive inheritance. So twenty five percent risk is given, and. Uh, Usually we test the mother also if there is, if it is in the mitochondrial gene, then we test the mother to look for the homoplasmy and heteroplasmy. Uh, and sometimes uh, we find that there are uncertain variants which have been found in a homoplasmy state in the mother. So we can interpret it better because the mother is asymptomatic and this is just one uh, child who is having the 
homoplasmy in the mother as well as the child. So we sort of interpret like that. But I was thinking as uh, can we do a gene correction? With regard to nuclear gene mutation. Yeah. So uh, certain certain disorders are amenable, not all of them, because the list of uh, genetic loci is like widely heterogeneous with regard to the um, um, Lake syndrome spectrum. A few of them are amenable to it. Again, ethical things are there, no? ethical well, concerns. If you know the there. outcome, yeah. you know, so yeah. that's something you can help the family. But yeah. uh, I think uh, it's still there are a lot of off targets and therefore are not really in this point of time where we can, uh, we're not so confident to use at this point of time. So I think still at the research mode, not, not really. Uh, there are some reports in England especially. They have that. Yeah. So I think it's still so many off targets so we really can't use at this point. Maybe this uh, uh, prenatal test, uh, like uh, TMS testing would be picking up some of the disorders where we can initiate early management. Like even neonatal screening is not uh, mandatory in all centers uh, currently in India. So only certain centers are doing it for like a comprehensive uh, TMS screening and the GCMS screening. It's not, it's not still mandatory here. So maybe that can pick up like early, early uh, give some clues for the underlying <coughs> disorders where we can initiate treatment in case of like, a, uh, yeah. That, that is a, I mean, a way to look at it because uh, in India, newborn screening is not yet universal, and these are many of them are treatable. So, if you have a child early detected and early intervention, then it would be much better outcome because um, they are coming from remote areas. And the other way is to have a like a maybe delayed diagnosis. The diagnosis is often delayed, so you lose time. Yeah. Since few of them are amenable to treatment, which are uh, which are picked up by TMS and GCMS, but there are many lot of disorders which are not picked up by TMS and GCMS. So in those patients, like probably we might uh, have to do what untargeted metabolomics, uh, which would be like a, a way ahead. Yeah. If there's no more questions, then thank you. Is a uh, PM uh, finally registrar and uh, his uh, focus, uh, his research project focuses on FCPD and uh, uh, investigations which are based on pancreatic uh, morphology. And so he's going to present, uh, present some of the cases uh, today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my presentation is on diabetes and mitochondrial diseases, uh, clinical insights. I'll be presenting how uh, diabetes is associated with mitochondrial diseases. And I'll be sharing a few of the cases which we have encountered uh, uh, in our hospital. As we all know, uh, mitochondrial diseases are heterogeneous group of disorders involving multi-system uh, involvement. And among them, endocrine involvement is also very common. So this is the picture depicting uh, the involvement of various endocrine organs. As we can see, almost all the endocrine organs are involved, uh, right from pituitary gland, adrenals, parathyroid, uh, thyroid, and also gonads. Uh, but uh, most importantly, uh, pancreas are most commonly involved, uh, leading to diabetes mellitus as well as exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So I'll be focusing on the involvement of pancreas and diabetes mellitus in mitochondrial diseases. Uh, it is important to understand uh, the association of uh, diabetes in mitochondrial diseases because uh, WHO classification 2019 has included mitochondrial DNA 30 to 43 mutation, which is a point mutation leading to MIDD, maternal in, uh, maternally inherited uh, di diabetes and deafness uh, um, in the list of monogenic diabetes causes. Uh, even though it has not included all the 14 genes of uh, MODI, it has, in, uh, it has included mitochondrial DNA 30, 30 to 43 mutation because of the increased frequency of this mutation in the population. Is mitochondrial diabetes rare? Uh, this was one of the study published in Japan. Uh, they looked at in 240 adult patients with diabetes mellitus and they studied the 30 to 43 mutation and they found the mutation was uh, uh, found in uh, almost 3% of the population. 
so it is not rare so we have to keep, uh, understand this uh, phenotype and we have to keep in mind whenever we are working up in patients with uh, diabetes mellitus this is the list of 14 gene panel which we are uh, doing currently in our molecular endo endocrine lab uh, uh, in a, any patient young onset diabetes mellitus with strong family history and uh, who is antibody negative with normal pancreatic morphology uh, we uh, we do this 14 gene panel and if it is negative then if there is a strong uh, suspicion then we go ahead with 62 gene panel and also we do mitochondrial dna analysis if clinically indicated so when should we suspect mitochondrial uh, diabetes as a cause of diabetes uh, when whenever there is a maternal inheritance where uh, uh, and there is a strong history of sensory neural hearing loss either in the patient or in the family members or there is multi system involvement then we have to consider mitochondrial diabetes mellitus as the cause of uh, the diabetes in this patient <coughs> so these are few of the patients uh, these are these are the genetic results which have come as positive in few of the patients i'll be discussing three of the patients among this the first patient is a 43 year old nurse uh, who had presented to us with a lean diabetes for 20 years she had several episodes of recurrent acute abdominal pain from the ages 18 to 35. This was recurrent pancreatic ep episodes and her amylase and levels were elevated during these episodes. Her lipids calcium were normal suggesting uh, as, uh, as these were not the cause of her pancreatitis. There was no anatomical anomalies uh, noted and there was no vasculitis. This was the CT abdomen in one of the acute episode which was showing a necrotic pancreatitis. Subsequently, uh, she was following up with us and she was uh, maintained on basal bolus insulin along with enzyme supplementation for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Her BMI was on lower side. It was less than 21 kg per meter square. This is the uh, CT image uh, during the follow-up after uh, repeated episodes of pancreatitis, uh, pancreatitis. This image shows atrophic pancreas with calcifications suggestive of uh, she has gone into chronic calcific pancreatitis. Now we will uh, see the pa patient's daughter's story. She, patient's daughter presented at the age of 13 years to pediatric neurology with complaints of proximal myopathy and recurrent admissions for status migranosis. During the admission, she used to have uh, lactic acidosis with lactate levels more than 10 millimole per liter. She did not have any dysmorphic features and she had normal growth. Uh, however, she also was found to have primary hypothyroidism with thyroid antibodies were negative and uh, her CPK and LDH levels were elevated. Subsequently, she was evaluated and muscle biopsy was done and uh, mitochondrial myopathy was diagnosed in her. So this is the family tree of our patient. This is our proband and this is the daughter. She succumbed to one of the admissions, uh, which uh, acute crisis when she was admitted. So our patient, uh, uh, the younger brother, uh, he wa was also suffering from diabetes mellitus at the age of 35 years. And he, uh, he expired at the age of 40 years with liver dysfunction. Uh, and patient's mother also had history of sensory neural hearing loss and uh, young onset diabetes mellitus at the age of 35 years. And uh, so as we can see, there is history of sensory neural hearing loss and epilepsy. And also there are varied clinical manifestations in different generations. We went ahead with mitochondrial uh, gene analysis, genetic analysis, and we found that uh, both were positive, do daughter and mother were positive for 3 to 4 3 mutation. However, the heteroplasmy was different in mother as compared to daughter. Daughter had high 45% uh, heteroplasmy as compared to 15% in mother. So, uh, because of the high degree of heteroplasmy, the, this mutation in pro daughter had a lethal phenotype. Uh, and uh, uh, our proband had 15% heteroplasmy. In our lab, we use uh, NGS sequencing for analysis of mitochondrial DNA analysis. On rest, uh, after we uh, got the history of daughter, then we went ahead, uh, went back and looked into <coughs> patients' uh, lactate levels and CPK levels and found that her lactate and CPK levels were mildly elevated. So the, uh, the learning point in this case was that 
uh, the mitochondrial diabetes can have varied manifestations and it can have a uh, varied clinical presentations because of the heteroplasmy this is the article uh, which have uh, which has described various gastrointestinal manifestations in mitochondrial disorders and it also mentions that pancreatitis with or without diabetes is also associated with mitochondrial diabetes mellitus this is one of the earlier case report in 2000 uh, which looked into uh, uh, in a family uh, the index patient her mother maternal aunt maternal grandmother all had diabetes mellitus associated with hearing loss and all were positive for 3 to 4 3 mutations the probands ultrasound and mrcp showed uh, a clinical uh, picture similar to our patient chronic pancreatitis with calcifications and duct dilatation Uh, the sec this is one one more case uh, where uh, where they looked into family of five members with th three to four three mutation positive and they had diabetes mellitus chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction which is commonly described in uh, mitochondrial disease and also had recurrent pancreatitis one of the patients imaging also showed chronic calcific pancreatitis and this uh, this is a list of 10 patients uh, which has been published um, from two uh, in 2013 all had neurological manifestations along with recurrent episodes of pancreatitis so uh, how mitochondrial disease and pancreatitis pancreas are related uh, there is a syndrome called as pearson syndrome it is an early onset mitochondrial uh, dna deletion disorder which is associated with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and however a few patients with insulin dependent diabetes in neonates and infants have also been described in this syndrome other uh, pancreatic disorders which have been uh, described with patients with mitochondrial disorders are uh, the chronic calcific pancreatitis has been reported apart from that pancreatic cysts the fatty replacement of pancreas that is pancreatic lipomatosis as well as asymptomatic elevation of amylase or lipase has been uh, described in patients with mitochondrial diseases the exact cause of pancreatitis in patients with mitochondrial disorders is not known however few theories have been speculated the metabolic defects in exocrine pancreatic cells promotes a defect in en exocrine enzyme secretion this lizard results in intracellular protease activation leading to pancreatitis and the composition of pancreatic secretions is also non physiological because of the mitochondrial dysfunction this leads to obstruction of the exocrine pathways and subsequently leads to pancreatitis coming to the second case uh, mrs r she presented to us in 2011 for the management of diabetes mellitus she was diagnosed to have cervical dystonia with titubation at the age of 19 years when she presented to us she was 24 years of age and there was no other history suggestive of other causes of diabetes mellitus no dka uh, and she did not have any hearing or visual abnormalities she had two miscarriages before coming to us and in uh, 2017 when she came to us her uh, we after good glycemic control she conceived twice and was managed with basal bolus insulin and post delivery she was put on premixed insulin she was also detected to have primary hypothyroidism and started on uh, thyroxine supplements this is a pedigree chart uh, this is our patient with diabetes mellitus and who also had titubation and uh, dystonia cervical dystonia as we can see patient's elder sisters Uh, one of the sister is mentally challenged, and one patient, uh, one of the uh, elder sister, had sensory neural hearing loss. And also, there was a strong a family history in the mother. She also had young onset diabetes mellitus at the age of thirty-five years. She was lean, and uh, her ultrasound abdomen was no normal, and anti uh, GAD antibody were negative. Her genetic analysis also revealed a thirty-two forty-two mutation. which was a reported as pathogenic variant so in this case the pointers towards mitochondrial diabetes mellitus was she was lean she had uh, neurological features in uh, terms of cervical dystonia family history of sensory neural hearing loss as well as mentally challenged state so movement disorders have been described in mitochondrial diseases various movement disorders including dystonia have been uh, described in mitochondrial disorders coming to third case a uh, 25 year old gentleman had presented to us with history of unintentional weight loss and osmotic symptoms his glucose values at presentation was 3 350 mg 
there was no history of dk and no other causes suggestive of other causes of diabetes family history it was significant uh, her mother sister and maternal uncles aunts cousins all had diabetes mellitus less than 40 years of age and however there was no history of any neurological problems no deafness no blindness in the family his bmi was 27 per kg per meter square he was initiated to on premixed insulin as he was not responding to sulfonylureas even though he had shorter duration of diabetes his gad antibody was negative ultrasound abdomen was normal however within 3 years of uh, diagnosis of diabetes mellitus his urinary albumin creatinine ratio was 879 mg per gram which indicates severely increased proteinuria his genetic analysis uh, revealed a mitochondrial mutation 744 Uh, uh, 7444. It has been classified as BUS because we have not screened the family members yet. Sir. The pointers towards mitochondrial DM in this patient was a strong maternal history of diabetes mellitus at young age, early renal dysfunction, and poor response to OADs. So this already has been explained uh, by Naya sir and uh, the uh, Sangeeta ma'am. so i'll not be discussing about in detail about these things however i want to mention hormone synthesis and secretion are highly energy dependent processes and all endocrine organs are prone to mitochondrial dysfunction because of this so um, as uh, already stated in, my, mutations can occur in mitochondrial dna or the nuclear mitochondrial proteins uh, clinically uh, there is difference in adults if we do if we are suspecting mitochondrial disease and we uh, and uh, we do genetic analysis two third are caused by mitochondrial dna variants however in children 80% are caused by nuclear mitochondrial genes uh, coming to diabetes phenotype in patients with uh, the most common uh, mitochondrial disorder associated with diabetes that is maternally inherited diabetes and deafness The, the association is most commonly seen with this point mutation, and it is uh, we, this uh, prevalence of this mutation varies in different populations, being highest in Japan at around that three percent. However, we uh, our Indian data is not uh, available. Diabetes can also be associated with other uh, mutations, <coughs> including Kanseyan syndrome, where large scale uh, mitochondrial DNA rearrangements happen. the average age of onset is 38 years for the uh, for mydd however it ranges from 40 to 56 years in other mutations cross sectional review has shown that 41% of patients with mydd they were initially cl uh, classified as non insulin dependent and 13% require insulin from the time of diagnosis and 8% patient also uh, presented with diabetic ketoacidosis indicating there is wide clinical presentation uh, with the patients with diabetes mellitus and mitochondrial disease this uh, variable phenotype can be partly explained by the heteroplasmy so uh, heteroplasmy uh, this is one of the uh, slide showing uh, how uh, uh, heteroplasmy affects the various individuals this is the primordial germ cell uh, when it starts dividing a few of the primary oocyte and mature oocyte they have wild type uh, mitochondrial dna this is homoplasmy with wild type dna whereas uh, this extreme shows uh, homoplasmy with um, uh, variant mutant dna so any uh, offsprings uh, who are born out of these uh, oocytes they have more severe phenotype as compared to the offsprings uh, who are born out of these oocytes and there is lot of uh, variability as a uh, can be explained based on the different levels of heteroplasmy the other uh, important finding that is seen in patients with diabetes and mitochondrial disease are their leaner presentation uh, uh, unless they are treated with uh, sulfonylureas or insulin after that they start gaining weight uh, in a french cohort of 54 patients with mydd the mean bmi was 20.2 a brief uh, explanation about uh, how develop uh, diabetes develops in patients with mitochondrial diseases it is mainly because of insulin deficiency as we all know uh, the insulin uh, the glucose sensing 
and secretion uh, it is an active process and uh, mainly depends on mitochondria uh, um, mitochondria hence uh, there is a, a defective insulin uh, secretion which uh, further uh, leads to progressive beta cell loss in the pancreas however it has also been shown that uh, they have combined insulin deficiency as well as insulin resistance in patients with 3 to 4 3 mutations and also commonly uh, many of the studies have looked into presence of autoimmunity in mididd and most of the studies have concluded that autoimmunity is not present in patients with mididd coming to clinical course clinical course and complications uh, as we have already seen there is high clinically variable manifestations of diabetes mellitus in patients with mitochondrial disease it can range from mild diabetes mellitus to presence with severe dkas patients with mitochondrial dm they have high risk of progression to insulin dependency as compared to classical type 2 diabetes mellitus and also it has been seen that high there are high prevalence rates for uh, development of complications of diabetes including peripheral neuropathy diabetic retinopathy and nephropathy the why genetic diagnosis is important uh, one is to look for uh, the development of other complications as we all know mitochondrial uh, disease is a multi system or multi system disease and they over the course they can develop various other manifestations as well and regarding treatment uh, the treatment with metformin should be careful in these patients because they are more prone for lactic acidosis and also statins have to be avoided in patients who have underlying myopathy and there are new reproductive options for patients with inherited mitochondrial dna pathogenic variants so uh, these are two techniques which has been uh, recently uh, described Uh, one is uh, uh, metaphase two transfer and one is pro nucleus pro nucleate transfer. Uh, this uh, we collect uh, the nucleus from the patient oocyte and we remove uh, the nucleus from the donor oocyte and inject this patient's uh, nucleus uh, into uh, into uh, the donor oocyte which has normal mitochondria and later on we fertilize with the partner sperm. And this is the other technique. This is after fertilization. we remove the pro nuclei and inject into the donor oocyte uh this is the proposed diagnostic algorithm for mitochond for suspected mitochondrial diabetes any patients less than 50 years of age and bmi is less than 30 years and uh, they are not classically uh, they don't have classical phenotypes of type 2 diabetes mellitus and they are antibody negative then we if there is strong family, uh, there is history of sensory neural hearing loss either among the patient or in the patient's family uh, uh, family and there is multi system involvement then we have to screen for the most common mutation which is associated that is 3 to 4 3 point mutation uh, so if this comes positive then we can classify them as mitochondrial diabetes uh, if it is comes negative but we still have a strong uh, suspicion based on the family history and neurological involvement then we can uh, discuss with neurogenetic team and then decide whether to do a full mitochondrial dna sequencing or long range pcr if it is positive then it can we can consider it as mitochondrial diabetes if it is negative then we have to consider other neurogenetic diseases associated with diabetes mellitus the common one are wolfram syndrome frederick's ataxia and myotonic dystrophy type 1 So to con, uh, uh, I thank Dr. Uh, Aaron and uh, team of Molecular Lab for helping me uh, in uh, understanding the genetics of mitochondria and also uh, collecting the patient's information. And I would also like like to thank uh, our uh, professors, uh, our uh, Dr. Professor Nihal Thomas for giving me this opportunity, and also our beloved HOD, Dr. Thomas Paul, Asha Ma'am, and Felix Sir and Nitin Sir. Questions? Yeah, yes. <laughs> no, this is a follow-up to my discussion I had with Nikhil earlier. You know, the chronic calcium pancreatitis was highly prevalent in Kerala, so now I think still prevalent here. And how much of that is uh, related to my point of view? But it may not be. But the question is, uh, there is a real need to really look at clinical you know, studies in this field. Yes, so that's exactly what uh, Anwar's thesis is all about. 
Exactly. We are looking at the patients who have young onset diabetes, and when they're GAD negative, we are imaging the pancreas. If they have uh, atypical features, which usually may not be any form of calcification, but just a smaller pancreas or very minimal speckle calcification, we are doing a genetic panel. So Aaron has actually evolved a 11 gene panel to look at hypoplastic pancreas. Yeah. And one of these genes is the mitochondrial gene. So far, I mean, I'm breaking the code, but what we have found is the HNF1 beta mutation or MOD5 appears to be the most common so far. But I think once we analyze our 40 sample, we know really where we stand. There are, I think there's a lot of heterogeneity. So we're getting a lot of different. There's one Norwegian study published about uh, 10 years back, which has also looked at this. And there's quite a lot of diversity, but they didn't look at the mitochondrial gene in, in that particular panel. And that's great fascinating. So you're looking at the real sequence? Uh, so right now it's a 11 gene panel, so we are into look for mitochondrial genome. We want to see the whole genome also. Let's look for variants because one of the biggest challenges in mitochondrial genome is classifying the variants. Also, once we identify these heteroplastic variants, classifying these variants uh, is also a challenge. So we still want to finish this 11 gene panel. Those negative probably will go ahead and uh, uh, look for the mitochondrial genome and other. What is the uh, like um, stroke? Uh, like this, this is a Mela's mutation. The, yes, ma'am. Yes. mutation from Mela's. So you get to see like stroke like episodes in your group? Yeah, few patients we have uh, who have developed diabetes mellitus as in initial symptom and later on they had presentation with uh, stroke like episodes also. So the biggest problem here is that these patients go to all kinds of specialties. And I'm quite certain that no one would even think about my I'm sure this patient had primarily stayed with the gastric toilets. No one would ever thought about uh, mitochondrial disorder. In fact, I am at failure in the sense that this patient was, I thought, chronic calcific pancreatitis for a number of years. Still, pediatric neuro picked up the child who had the myopathy. So now we include the three to four three in the body panel itself. So that mutation so that, that is covered in body panel itself. Yes. So in the negative, but still we see a maternal inheritance, we go for doing the whole mitochondrial genome to look for other. Yeah. The biggest challenge is that uh, percentage of head problems. Yeah, so classification yeah. of these variants is a great challenge, but uh, I think uh, that is why it's very really difficult to counsel them also. Genetic counseling becomes very tricky in these situations. Thank you, Anwar. Thank you. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.